Well, hello and welcome everyone. I hope you all had a wonderful day. And today we are gathered and we're just going to have a fun time reacting to some videos by Ian Juby. Now, joining me today, I also have a special guest who many of you are probably familiar with already and who has made himself known by the super chat. Uh, this is uh, <laughs> from Michael Pandegraff. Um, he is a physic, uh, uh, he has a PhD in physics, right? Yes. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for the super chat already. <laughs> <laughs> no problem. Yeah. Well, let's see. Let's bring that up. He's been trying to get me to uh, start a uh, channel membership, but I have yes. not been regular with my posting, which is why I haven't done that yet. <laughs> That's all right. So how familiar are you with Ian Juby? Have you watched um, any of his videos before? I don't know. Like, I've probably watched them on... I've probably seen them on Dapper's channel, right? Dapper, have you had, had Ian on? Yeah, he I said assume... he had one video on his channel in the side chat yeah. here. Like, yeah. the name is familiar, and, like, also, I mean, you know the circles we run in. If if it's on yeah. your channel, like, it's probably somebody I've heard of from Dapper or Erica or, you know, or Dan, Dr. Dan. <laughs> yeah, so I learned about Ian last year. Um, I looked up his channel, and one of the first videos that I found on his channel was a video talking about hominid fossils, and that was kind of the latest one that had been released. And so, of course, since that's my area of interest, that's what I clicked on to watch. And, um, well, you'll, you'll see exactly what went on in that video because that's what we're going to be looking at today. And there's some recent updates, and uh, we'll, we'll dive into all of that. So this it video has some pieces that I found kind of less relevant uh, for us to talk about taking out. Um, but we're going to watch and to shorten it a little bit. So we're going to watch uh, this video. You can find it linked below down in the description. It's the final part of Ian Juby's series. Uh, do you have anything to say before we get started? Um, hello, everyone. I see, uh, I see that Dapper and Rebecca are both in the chat. So yeah, we've got quite a few people Pleasure here. to see uh, everyone. That's awesome. Thanks for everyone who's joining in. All right. Oh. Uh, I guess hit I will, that like oh. button. I just hit it, but I had already hit it, so I unliked it. So I had to relike it. So you know. And we've also got Guzman, join, Guzman joining in here. So thank you for joining in, everyone. All right, I will start the video here. Let's let's find a suitable way to view it. All right, here we go. I'm also gonna try and oh wait, that just <laughs> just reset it correctly. Okay. Sorry, I, I was going to try and because before the the way it was cropped, I like felt like much bigger than I wanted to be. But this okay. is like a more reasonable size. Okay, so. awesome. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. I will go ahead. Hopefully everyone can see this all right. Hello again and welcome back to the final lecture in this series. I've got a lot I've got to pack into this short half hour, so let's get right to it. As I mentioned in the very first lecture of this series, this fossil sequence, the descent of man, does not exist anywhere in the world except textbooks and in the imaginations of its believers. I, I want to just stop and comment here that this is kind of uh, a very typical way that people portray human evolution. On the one hand, having the ape and then just getting upright until it basically just stands perfectly upright. But if you actually talk to, you know, professionals in the field of paleoanthropology, this is kind of a misunderstanding and somewhat of a gross kind of oversimplification of what human evolution is presumed to be by those who believe in it. By the way, I'm a young earth creationist. Um, and I'm and not. So, yeah. So we have some differing perspectives here, which is great. Um, so you wouldn't see evolution as this straightforward of a process because of all the various hominin species that we have, it's more kind of like a, a tangly bush with all different outgrowths rather than kind of a straight linear prog uh, straight kind of linear march of progress. Yeah, yeah exactly. Exactly. Okay. And also, I mean, for the record, I, I don't want anybody to, to get the idea that I'm coming here and acting like because 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 this is a thing that a lot of people do. They assume that because they have a PhD that they're qualified to like opine on everything. 
Peter knows much more about paleoanthropology than I do, even though I don't agree necessarily with his conclusions. Uh, he, he he knows the stuff a lot better. I'm just a physicist. We're just hanging out to have fun and uh, comment on this together. <laughs> yeah, I don't want anybody to think that I'm I'm uh, uh, going outside my lane. <laughs> But yeah, no, I think that this is this is like one of the most typical sort of straw men. This is the equivalent of um, the image of the atom with the literal orbits around it. It's it's worse, though, I would say, Hmm. you know, because that. The tangled weave thing is like a tangled bush sort of thing. It's fairly easy to understand. The actual, and I think it's more realistic, electrons. right? Electrons. Yeah, it is. It is. Just it's in, easy in to modern populations, answers. we don't see these kind of linear <laughs> diversifications. We see all sorts of hybridization and stuff like that. We've yeah. also got a new major. You're still you're still pretty young, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's. Uh, if I were to do it, like I mean, I can imagine um, there are apparently there have been some people who have have used. Uh, some atomic physics te techniques to try and do sort of materials analysis. Like you crush up a sample yeah. and then you try and vaporize it. And if you can, if you can capture a couple of atoms of a very rare thing, like isotopic uh, can... analysis. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Because for, for like the things in my experiment to work, it, if we have if one little voltage is off by a few millivolts in the experiment, then we won't be tuned to the exact right resonance for that isotope of strontium. And we're not going to get a different isotope of strontium. We're just going to get nothing. So you can be extremely precise about exactly what it is you're measuring. See, we're being interdisciplinary here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I'll let it roll. When we go to the fossil record, what we find is fossils for both apes and man together, or in a backwards sequence. Now, I mean, I'm going to agree that we find fossils of apes and fossils of humans, and that there is not a transition between. But I disagree with what he's saying about this kind of backwards um, uh, reverse. He, he's basically arguing that humans first appear, and then the apes appear later. Oh, is is that what yeah, you took no, him to that's be saying? Not, yeah, that that I I so what I sort of thought he was saying was more that humans were interspersed like all throughout, and that I just don't think is the case. And, mm -hmm. um, yeah, no, it's no. <laughs> but also, I mean, obligatory statement that humans, in my view, are apes, but. I'm, I won't. I won't keep on saying that because even well, I think that's an important thing br yeah. to bring up, and that was something that I was going to actually remark on as well. Mm -hmm. Because you're right that in a technical way, yeah, we would classify humans as apes because they have the sorts of features which are diagnostic of apes. If you have those features, you're an ape, right? It has to do with certain features of the face and having like fingernails instead of claws and yeah. some stuff, which we of course do have. And then, like, if, so correct me if I'm wrong. Um, I, like the chin is specifically Homo sapiens, right? Correct. Yes. For example, uh -huh. okay, that would be one. Yeah. But like, and then like inner ear bones are those mammals or are those primates? The the three, the like hammer, stirrup, and amble. I believe it is mammals, but I might be wrong on that. Dapper dinosaur might be able to fact check us in the chat. <laughs> Dude, he knows like so much he's just like a general like sponge of knowledge i i had to watch his channel for a year of like close listening and then like a previous two years of like more casual listening before he finally made an error in my field that i was able to call him out on <laughs> oh yeah i was right here he's he's got us yep three inner ear bones is mammal okay awesome now having said that humans are apes in a technical sense I think it's still useful to use the term ape in a more kind of lay sense. And you'll see that's common even yeah. among professional paleoanthropologists to use ape, yeah. which, which is what kind of annoys me when certain like YouTube evolutionists correct people like all the time, not recognizing yeah. that like people who agree with them in their own fields use it in the same sense.
And no. in my experience, yeah. a lot a lot of them, even if, if they were to watch themselves back closely, they also do. Like yeah. um Erica Gutsick Gibbon, she she uses ape to mean non human apes. Um in and, and she acknowledges that this isn't something that she's hiding, yeah. but it's yeah, it's words can have multiple definitions and they can all be useful at different yes. times. Yes. <laughs> Like the word theory. <laughs> oh, yeah, that's a big one. Yeah. In response to my comments, one skeptic attempted to ridicule me, saying, Oh, Ian, humans are apes. Look, you're not fooling anybody with that ridiculous argument. Humans are a group all their own. Do you see apes? Okay, humans can be a group all to their own while still being apes because we can have nested hierarchies. So there's a group inside of a group, in which case humans can be apes, but not all apes can be humans, right? So, yeah. <laughs> oh, we've got reason to doubt showing up. Thanks for joining us. I all right. put on a bow tie. I don't have a bow tie. <laughs> <laughs> Painting artwork? Performing complex mathematical calculations? Designing, building, operating, and maintaining complex machinery? Designing and playing complex musical instruments? Designing and building complex weaponry to participate in guerrilla warfare? Complexity is in the eye of the beholder, I would say, for one. Did he say guerrilla warfare or guerrilla <laughs> warfare? Because <laughs> I could have thought of it in a second. <laughs> I mean, if if he did say that, I'm going to give him that one. That's kind of funny. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I don't know a whole lot about Ian Juby, but he seems like a, a pretty nice person. I don't have anything like personally against him. And he, he definitely has a good sense of like humor, it seems. And he's very energetic in his videos, which I appreciate. Yeah, yeah. Or apes posting comments on YouTube claiming that humans are apes. But I want uh, you yes. to know, you are not just an ape to me. How are you using the word? I mean, sure, if you're going to use it in a lay sense, no. But yeah. You have to, I feel like, especially when you're trying to be specific about things like this, you really just need to be clear about what you are claiming. because Exactly. <laughs> because exactly. he's not going to deny that the closest, the most similar creature to humans is a chimpanzee. He's not I, I would assume, that. I would assume he wouldn't deny that. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I don't know that really anybody does deny that. So, I don't think so. You are an amazing human being designed in the image of our Creator God, and He does love you with a great love. Yes, there are similarities between apes and humans, but you can identify the fossil form just based on its bones. Why? Because they're still around today. Let's take a very brief That's look not at why. some of the- That's not why. You can identify two different creatures, neither of which are around today by their bones. Why? Because the bones are different. If the bones yeah. weren't different, then you wouldn't have two categories. It, yeah, I mean, it seems what he's doing here is basically just gonna say that Australopithecines are apes and probably going to argue that they're related to the great apes therefore and just argue that basically the great apes therefore are just kind of the living continuation of this australopithecine lineage or a closely related one yeah major differences so you can train your eyes to spot them all right so we're going to learn exactly what the major differences between humans and apes are i mean i'm going to learn this picture you already know <laughs> shows an adult pygmy woman skeleton north american male adult male and an adult male gorilla major differences to look for one we already discussed in parts 25 through 30 of the series the feet the apes have that diverging big toe whereas human feet are unique so yeah i mean uh, chimpanzees and gorillas and orangutans all orangutans all have what is called a uh, divergent hallux, which means basically on your hand, you have one digit which sticks out to the side. 
right? And that allows you to grasp stuff. So mm -hmm. if I try to grasp something without using my thumb, it makes it quite a bit harder to actually do that. And that's why you can't really grab stuff very well with your feet because your foot, first of all, isn't very flexible. Our hands are much more flexible because the bones in our wrists can move around a lot more. And obviously, because there's not uh, flesh connecting all of the digits, forcing them to go straight together. So chimps and gorillas can have a digit that sticks out to the side, and their foot is way more flexible than ours, meaning that they can grab stuff with their feet, and that's really useful for climbing as well. But the issue here is that having a uh, convergent big toe, meaning one that goes straight forward in line with all the rest, just like we do, isn't actually unique to uh, humans. Uh, let me pull uh, up some slides that I have here. So first of all, here we have, this is called the Dikika foot. Um, so this comes from Dikika, Ethiopia. This is from Australopithecus afarensis. And this is from a juvenile, I believe yeah, about three it, years old. There, there's a famous specimen called the Dikika child, right? Yeah, this, so this is from her. I believe it's a female. I'm pretty sure it is a female. Yeah. Can, can so, you identify that from the foot? Or I, we, no, but we they, have, other they have more okay. of the skeleton. Let me see if I can pull that up. I, like the pelvis is the obvious thing that I know you can identify um, uh, sex from. I don't know about other mm -hmm. uh, traits. Basically, craniofacial anatomy would be the next big thing. Um, okay, so I got a uh, tab up here. Let's see, window. Okay. Um, how do I do this? Okay, there we go. Perfect. So there you should be able to see that is the mm -hmm. Dikika child. Um, so I'm guessing if they have attributed the sex, which I believe they have, yeah, it says it, young girl right it there. It says right there. It is based off of the skull. Females tend to be like more gracile, which means that the various parts of the face aren't as well developed. So when you look at like gorillas, for example, male gorillas have a big crest down the middle of their head and they're bigger. All sorts of things like that can play into sex determination. And you can see down there, way in the right, there is the mm -hmm. foot right there. And we also have some other limb bones, which are also relevant to the question of whether they were walking upright. But uh, we'll see if we get to that. Okay, um, here we go. Yeah, so there was the Dikika foot. So one of the important things about the Dikika foot is that we can attribute it to a skeleton, right? It's not just an isolated find. It was found in this block of sandstone. And um, one thing, how we know that it, it goes to the rest of the skeleton there is that it's a juvenile. So when you look at like the tibia here, you can see that down at the bottom, it's not um, completely fused. And so over time, when bones grow, they fuse. And so we can tell that this is a juvenile and not an adult. And so its stage of maturation matches the rest of the remains. So people who claim that this isn't from the rest of the remains have to claim the less parsimonious explanation that there's apes and humans that are exactly the same age right there and both happen to die and both get fossilized and be the same body size and whatever else <laughs> so it maybe it gets the more human, complex maybe the human family had a pet ape there we go okay now, <laughs> <laughs> answers in genesis is literally claiming this did really? you know that yeah so no, recently homo naledi um let's see do i have homo naledi yeah that by the way this is a flex right here this is awesome <laughs> <laughs> So here's the skull of Homo Naledi, right? Ah, okay, there we go. Um, so basically, based on my research with Dr. Todd Wood, we concluded that this guy is human. But some people have been big critics of that idea, such as Answers in Genesis and uh, the Institute for Creation Research. Mm -hmm. And just a couple of weeks ago, actually, the team released a paper, some preprints. So they haven't been peer reviewed yet, but they are releasing these preprints, which document the plausible burials of Homo naledi, and then also like engravings in the cave and a stone tool, which is associated with the hands, hand bones of one of the mm -hmm. possible burials. I don't think I had heard 
as much about the the stone. To, was it found potentially like in in articulation with the, that? Would yeah. Be, so the hand was really? articulated around like it. A, a, oh wow okay so it was buried holding the thing is is the the idea possibly i possibly. i there's there's still a lot of i think research to Very be done new. about burial position mm -hmm. because that to me is kind of the critical thing that they have the team hasn't really figured out yet yeah but the way that yeah. i was relating this is the answers in genesis and answers new segment actually argued that these this place down in the rising star cave system could be a pet graveyard. Um, Cause we found like tons of different home and Letty there, which to me, I, I would have thought that they would have just argued that these weren't really burials. Cause that to me seems to be like the easy out of the problem. Yeah. Pet graveyard that, I mean, it burying pets is, I would, I would assume a later development after burying kin. Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a number of problems with, with with that idea. One is that we have no idea that people had pets at that time, right? Yeah. Pets don't appear till way later. Even if in the Bible we hear that people domesticated animals before the flood, and that's, that's these are yeah, these are post flood remains, but that's still a, a difference in well, type. And furthermore, the earliest yeah. pets were utilitarian. Dogs were for hunting and other activities like that. So I don't know what, yeah, well, what I mean, people were yeah, doing with their home and the that's, pets. That's a very continuous line. I mean, we we know that people got people get attached to animals, wild animals even that yeah. aren't domesticated. People can become very attached to. So yeah, but. I think another kind of thing is that why would these people go through all this intense labor just to bury pets back in this cave? And then why wouldn't they yeah. also bury humans back in the cave? Like if you're going to treat that's your pets with that respect wouldn't you think you'd also bring humans back there yeah my so. understanding of uh of, of this whole uh new recent relatively recent discovery is that it's really hard to get back there mm -hmm. and it's probably gotten harder over the long years but it was probably not that easy for homo naledi to get back there either yeah um, no definitely not you have to squeeze through all these tiny chambers. There's something called the Superman's crawl. You got to lay down on your stomach, turn your head sideways, and put one arm in front to squeeze through it. And then you have to climb 50 feet up this gigantic piece of rock that fell from the ceiling. And then you have to drop down this chute, which I think is like eight inches wide or something like that in places. I mean, some of those things, I I feel like, I feel like they almost had to have been less difficult back when they were doing it because it, it's maybe it's just so hard to explain <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean i for me it's personally hard to realize that somebody would go through that amount of effort to bury a human much less a pet yeah i i agree with you i'm like that that's that that just sounds like a lot of work like uh, it right Cave, yeah. Dapper's like, there's no way he'd go into that cave. Like, yeah, caves are. I, I got stuck once in a cave, and oh I had I had friends in front of me and friends behind me. I was on. A, I was in a very, very, very popular cave. It was um, it was for a Boy Scout like camping trip that I was on, and I I knew academically in my head I was totally safe, um, and I I got myself unstuck. It was terrifying on a primal level because you're stuck and even though i had light and everything you still know you're underground in the dark yeah it's horrifying it's hard to rescue people that get stuck too yeah. i mean like you would think we would have better advancements that they could sort of like open up the cave chambers like in the rising star cave system when they're doing excavations back there but apparently they haven't been able to do that well sort of that stuff. or they also might not want to destroy things that's possible, but I feel like it would be more important to for for the sake of the team's lives it, and safety. If, if it's if it's if it's actually dangerous, then yes, if it is. Just, Lee if, Berger, if who leads the it? team, he went in there one time. He almost died. He got well, stuck. Wow. Yeah. So it's pretty dangerous. <laughs> Hope they pay the grad students well. <laughs> uh. So the important thing about um, this Dakika foot is that when we look at it, the bone off of which the um, off of which that big toe hinges has 
a curvature to it, right? Um, is this the right thing? Yes. Um, okay, so we can see there that this facet, which I believe this is on the medial cuneiform bone of the foot, it has this basically curved place where it attaches to the metatarsal. And what we can see here is a graph showing, um, so showing that. And what's evident is that Dakika falls basically in between the range of Homo and the range of gorillas and chimpanzees. So that's pretty good evidence that their, um, the range of their first metatarsal was not as limited as it was in chimps, but it wasn't as straightforward as it was in humans either. So it's an mm -hmm. intermediate character state, I would say. Mm -hmm. And yeah, and we've, okay, yeah, so we've, we're looking at, this is the star? Yeah, so so yeah, for, the, okay. for the left, we're looking at the metatarsal facet angle by the radius of curvature. And okay, you can yeah. See and there, then, it's falling by itself, but it's still kind of in between the two ranges yeah, of, sort of apes a, and humans. Mm -hmm. And then on and the then, right, uh, it, it's that one line because it's a single... It, yeah, because it, there it, it's just the single It's only including these particular uh, specimens, right? Yes, uh-huh. Now, what's interesting here to observe is that AL333-28, um, that's an, I believe it's a, an adult, um, Australopithecus afarensis. So what you see there is that the adult actually has a more ape-like um, trend than does the juvenile, which is the opposite of the trend that we see in humans. You can see, so the light-colored bar there for humans is further to the left than the right. So that means that juvenile, so kids, are more similar to chimps in terms of this curvature than uh, adults are. But you see the opposite pattern in the apes. So you can see there the bars for the um, juveniles are further to the right, meaning that they're less curved and the adults go further to the left. So Australopithecus afarensis might have followed that. I think this is kind of skimpy evidence when we only have two plot points here. <laughs> so we definitely need more data to actually and substantiate I, we, that. I know that's we the have, I know we have more specimens. We we have a number of specimens of um, Australop Australopithecus afarensis, right? We do, but I think um, these may be the only two um, medial uh, cuneiform bones. Which which one is uh, that? The, the Dakika one, and then this AL three 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 one. Oh, these are the, these are the the feet. Uh, those are the only two medial cuneiform bones. So we may have other parts of the foot duplicated more often, but I didn't know this cuneiform bone. could refer to a bone. I thought cuneiform was a type of ancient Sumerian writing. So. <laughs> <laughs> Words can have multiple meanings. There we go. <laughs> so another example of this is the little foot, little foot's foot. <laughs> um, originally, people thought that this had a divergent big toe, but then we actually found more bones and they found that it couldn't fit together in an ape like way. So, well, it's because they took that Dremel tool and just went, <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna get to that. We're gonna get right. to that. <laughs> I, I, I have seen this already, and that, that does come in, and I've got my <laughs> pelvis here <laughs> ready for that. <laughs> So this is um, what happened was they actually found these bones before they found the rest of the little foot skeleton. They found them in the cave and they found it with um, the bottom of the ankle joint. And they actually went around in the cave trying to fit that bone to one of the bones sticking out of the walls of the cave. And within several days, they actually found the fit and found which bones fit together. And so then after that, for years, they were excavating into the wall and sure enough right there they found the whole rest of the skeleton as well so that was wow. pretty crazy detective work yeah cool but anyway the whole point here is that we have evidence that australopithecines had a convergent alex and not a divergent one yeah that's gonna that's gonna support uh the idea of bipedality right exactly yeah i mean it if you don't have a grasping foot you're not going to be as great at climbing in the trees. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And you need, you, you need that sort of pillar robust, um, kind of almost monolithic, um, 
supporting arch-like structure or what became an arch-like structure for uh, to to be like at anatomically modern, right? To be anatomically modern, yes. But there were plenty of different people that that didn't have arch foot. Let's see if I can find one here a second. Yeah. I also have a friend who would complain because he had flat feet. My friend would complain about his flat feet all the time. And they were <laughs> remarkable. <laughs> yeah, so this is the foot of Homo naledi. Um, they may have had a little bit of an arch, but it wasn't like our arch, apparently. And so this is an example of a human having a non-arched foot. And so, yeah. All right. I will... Uh, yes, isn't Littlefoot the most complete hominid fossil? Yes, Littlefoot is the most complete hominid fossil. Well, not hominid fossil because we have more complete like um, stuff from Homo sapiens as yeah, well. Yeah, like but it's the most hominin early hominin that isn't later. That yeah, exactly. And see this right there, right there. There are people who would nitpick what dapper just said like people on my side who would nitpick what dapper just said and be like no because blah 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 and it's like you know like you have to be able to give a certain level of conversational like yeah. charity is the word i use but we're all gonna just, slip up yeah well also it's not slipping up it's like you know what the person means exactly yeah <laughs> when he says hominin in this context you and i both mean that he means hominin being the like most recent most specific thing that they fall within and not anything later <laughs> <laughs> oh i do dapper i do <laughs> going on up to the pelvis the difference between apes and so notice there we got no mention of lucy's foot bones she has a few um we got no mention of any australopithecine foot bones just Humans and apes have different types of feet. Boom. Yep. Very honest. All right. Um, the pelvis. Humans is significant. You can even tell the gender of a person just by their skeletal structure. The you can, well, yeah. I mean, uh, let me see here. When you look at a pelvis, the part that you look at here is called the greater sciatic notch. In males, this tends to be very a very narrow notch. And then in females, it tends to be a little bit wider, which basically opens up the uh, the pelvic cavity a bit more to allow birthing. That all tracks. There we go. This pygmy woman's pelvis is only 23 centimeters or about nine inches across. I have here a replica of a chimpanzee pelvis to compare with the human female pelvis as well as a pygmy human female pelvis. The pelvis is composed of three major bones. The center bone called the sacrum in, and the bottom of that bone is where your coccyx or tailbone attaches. These two side bones that make up your hips are called innominates. Notice the start differences between the ape innominates, which are very long compared to human. Notice also the stark difference between the human sacrum and that of the apes, which are exceedingly long and narrow. Yeah, so one of the reasons that apes actually have long sacrum, sacrum uh, is because they actually have a whole extra vertebrae in there. Humans have five and Chimps have six. Let me count them. One, two, three, four, five. Six. Yep, that one has six. Does it? It does, yep. I can see. Are you counting the little holes? No, so the holes are at the bottom of each. So it's the space in between each set of holes. Okay, so because I see, I see five holes, so it's like a fence post problem where you've got like five fence posts for... Or... Yeah, for six fence something. Yeah. I don't know. Never mind. <laughs> yeah, and then you've got the coccyx on the end yet. Okay. So, yeah. Yep. So here's what he's talking about in terms of the difference between the pelves. You can see here that we have kind of like a short kind of squat pelvis, and Lucy does too. And then chimps just have this like extremely elongated pelvis. Yeah. And so so I have to ask, it, he seems to be making 
the case for bipedality. Yeah, and you'll you'll see why in a minute. Okay. He he is definitely doing that. You're right. Um. So so earlier I mentioned the sci the greater sciatic notch here. Um. You can see how in chimps it doesn't form like this tight curve. Yes. Lucy Lucy is more similar to like the range of variation seen in modern people and fossil hominins, but chimps they have just a very long kind of curve, and that's related to basically the biomechanics of the pelvis. So basically, if you look at a human pelvis, it's basically a chimp pelvis, but like squashed uh, vertically. And that basically makes it shorter, squatter, and makes that uh, little notch more narrow. And it almost, it's almost bent also. It's like, it's like, cur I always hear the human pelvis described as like a bowl to yeah. like hold the abdomen up. Exactly. Yeah. So when you look at it from uh, above, you can see that it has like a number of different kind of places where it goes up and down. It kind of forms a wavy surface. So on the inside, it's very kind of smooth and rounded. And when you have a chimp, theirs just goes more straight out to the side mm -hmm. um, because instead of supporting their guts from underneath, they're kind of like hanging them down underneath the pelvis. These differences alone are so glaring that even a rank amateur can spot the differences, and you are about to put that into practice. Take a look here at these skeletons of the orangutan, female gorilla, male gorilla, chimpanzee, and human. Can you spot the differences? Sorry, I was I was uh, making a snide <laughs> remark to Dapper. Uh, can you go back like five seconds? Uh, yeah, hold on. Ne no, never mind. Can I spot the differences? Yes, I can. <laughs> <laughs> They're very obvious. The first, one of these things is not like the other. <laughs> <laughs> you can see that uh, chimps, gorillas, and orangutans, they all have just very, very long pelvis. Long arms, their short wings, legs, their wings huge, way the size. huge wing-shaped pelvis that then go way down. Very broad um, rib cages also. Yeah. Um, well, brought at the bottom. You can see, bottom, especially yeah. on that grill tapers. in the middle, it, it tapers, tapers up to the top. And then yeah, you can also humans see are more like oval. They they almost come back. They they almost start to curve back in. Yeah. Yep. And then when you also look at their shoulders, apes kind of have like a shrugged look a little bit because their um the glenoid fossa of their scapula, so the bone off of which your arm hinges, is pointed more upwards, which is because they're going like this all the time when they're climbing, mm. right, in the trees. And so as a result, when they put their arms down, it looks a little bit like they're kind of shrugging. Also, in this particular image, I'm noticing that the the angle, at least as displayed, of the knee is very different. Like yeah. the, the human one looks sort of like it's it's kind of almost angled inwards, and the other ones either look more or less straight or potentially outwards. But it could be a, a matter of posture as well. I'm not sure. You're you're right that that is a distinction. Yeah, they the gorilla there isn't like properly set up to be able to see that. But yeah, human femora just basically are slanted inward so that we can balance better. Is that, that what valgus to... knee means? Yes, exactly. The bicondylar angle, valgus knee, all of that kind of refers to this angling of the knee joint, which is something that we see in Lucy actually and other australopithecines. They have those angled uh, femora. Notice the pelvises of the apes are all radically different than that of the human. Notice the differences in the overall skeletal structure just between the female and male gorillas. The sexual dimorphism is quite pronounced, especially on the skull. That male has a pronounced ridge across the top of the head called the sagittal crest, whereas it's basically non-existent on the female. Male gorillas also have like bigger canine teeth, which are like the two pointy teeth on the top and on the bottom. Um, yeah, they're, they're just overall bigger generally. I, I got to work with some um, gorilla bones while I was working on a project, which is coming out soon, actually. Um, for those who don't know, not next week, but the week after that is the International Conference on Creationism. And I'm going to be presenting a talk there. Where's so. that at? Uh, it's being held at Searville University in Ohio. Oh, 
It's in Ohio. Okay, I was yes. going to ask, is Joel Duff going to be there? But if it's in Ohio... I think he Ohio... was planning to be, but I don't think he's going to make it. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, I know, dude. <laughs> we, I, like, because he's, he's from Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um... That's yeah. awesome, though. Congratulations. <laughs> I don't know why I brought... Th- oh, yes. Gorilla Bones are just crazily large. Like, they are just massive, and it... Actually, that kind of makes it difficult to interpret some of like the anatomical features because you can be looking at like a gorilla bone and it'll look different. But a lot of it just has to do with like weight bearing and stuff like that because they're just so much larger that it kind of messes with some of the anatomical features, whereas chimps are more human sized. And so it's kind of easier to compare them. Because skulls can become smashed, distorted, and fragmented in the fossil record, small yet significant differences can become really important. For example, unless you recently got in a fist fight, you can feel a bony ridge here at the top of your nose. Okay, yeah, I I feel one. Mm -hmm. This enables you to wear (laughs) glasses. Apes do not have this. They typically have what we call... We have an example here. Um, Let's see, how do we... It's right here. I'll be yeah, your example. There we go. Yep. Yeah, he's, we got. He's got, we got a projecting nose. Uh huh. Although the thing is, the other thing that really helps for this is uh, the ear. It hooks around the ear. So like, if I didn't have that, you know, I'd still. But mm. I don't know if you can tell much about. Can you tell much about ears? Do we do we know much about ears of of hominins and whatnot? Because it's it's not it's not uh, bony. It's cartilaginous. Yeah. The at, only at thing that we really know about is the inner ear bones. Yeah. Um, and even those, we often don't have very many preserved. There aren't a lot of examples of preserved ear bones. We've got some from Homo naledi and maybe I think some from Neanderthals, but we don't, we don't know much about external ear structure. And I don't know that there are like that many significant differences between the ears of humans and apes. I would I would have to look into that. I have no idea about that. Who knows? The shovel face, as you can see on the chimp and gorilla skulls. I have a quick test I call the Oculus test. Oculus is the Latin word for glasses. I have here a modern human skull. And as you can see, you can wear gla- they can wear glasses because of that bony ridge. If I take the skull fondly referred to as Mrs. Pless, we can demonstrate that she is clearly an ape. The glasses slide right off of her shovel face, and she fails the Oculus test. Well, she doesn't have any ears, bro. <laughs> I, yeah. It would be handy if it were this simple to distinguish between humans and apes, and we could just be like, well... Glasses test. Argument um, ad glassium. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, it is not that simple. Um, Dapper Dinosaur here says that he has saved pics of a gorilla skull with that nasal ridge. You'll have to send that to me. I'd like to check that out. Um, it also does show up in other apes. Uh, so a lesser ape here, the gibbon, you can see he has a projecting nasal bone. So he could actually wear glasses. They'd have to be small glasses, but he could wear them. I didn't uh, realize Gibbons had such large canines. Yeah, that's what that is, Gibbons right? have really large canine teeth. And the but Erica bit... seems so nice. Because, <laughs> I mean, and and I, they, she doesn't look like she... And, and Gibbons have almost no sexual dimorphism, right? Uh, it, no, they actually... Well, you can tell them based on their canine teeth apart. And oh, like, is that is that like of, one of the few things that? Yeah. Okay. And cause... also on coat color, it might be more species specific, but I know, for example, okay. that white-cheeked gibbons, uh, one sex is white, the other is black. Oh, interesting. So they have kind of the opposite color scheme. So okay, so we can't use this as a test because otherwise we're going to say that gibbons are human. Um, but we also can't use this as a test because there's certain humans that don't have nasal bones that are projecting like this. Um, Let's see here. Yes, so this is D2700. This is one of the Dimenizi crania. They're from uh, the Republic of Georgia. And let me make this screen bigger. And here you can see as I have it, and it does not have those projecting nasal bones. Mm -hmm. However, it has a lot of features that it shares in common with humans. And so... 
it's very globular. The the shape of the cranium is looks large and and rounder. Yeah. Uh, another thing you can see it it doesn't have like very large canine. Teeth. Yeah. It doesn't it doesn't have a canine diastema, which even Australopithecus afarensis has, which is like mm -hmm. a little gap in between these two teeth for them to slide together. I think it's variable in afarensis. Oh. Okay. But, um, yeah, and there's all sorts of different features of the skull which align more with Homo humans than with apes, and I, so. And yeah. so what is, that's a specimen of what? Um, there's disagreement about its classification. Some call it Homo georgicus, but I think it more just generally could be called Homo erectus. It's a very kind of early okay. erectine. Yeah, uh, Homo erectus is uh, a very expansive um, classification, right? Yeah, I mean, because you've got stuff way out in Asia that is... Some people call that Homo erectus, and then they call basically the Homo erectus in Africa Homo ergaster. And then okay. there's Homo georgicus, which is what this is sometimes called. And then there's still yet another thing, um, like Homo antecessor. Sometimes some people call it Homo erectus. So it, it is expansive, definitely. Yeah. Oh, and then I had one more example. This one creationists tend to disagree about. I think it's human. Um, it's also from Dimenizi. Let me uh, let, let me get the slide back up here because I also had a slide for that. Uh, there we go. Oh, not that. Oh, I guess I removed it. Okay, well, this is another Dimenizi crania. It also does not have projecting nasal bones. Um, and yet another example, if we needed more to prove this point, is Homo naledi. Omnaletti didn't have protecting nasal bones either, it doesn't seem like. And yet, they seem to have been burying their dead. So, it seems Honestly, like there might be some yeah. issues with the glasses test. I mean, I'm not going to lie. Also, like, the part of my nose that my glasses actually... Li like, if, if you just push my glasses down here, right? Like, you can see where they're, they're running into my nose. They're running into it right there. And hmm. that's that kind of right below is, that point. Yeah, that's cartilaginous. That right there, I can feel it. Uh. That's cartilage, not bone. <laughs> so, so. I, yeah, because like apes tend to have a flat nose, so they wouldn't even have it stick out like this. But yeah. I that might there might be some variation with that in hominins. So when we look at Homo naledi, for example, um, there's a little basically point right here on the bottom of the nasal aperture. I, it's the inferior nasal spine or something like that. Um, in some of these early hominins, it doesn't like stick upwards like it does in Homo naledi. So in that, it's more human-like in having this uh, nasal spine here that sticks in a more human-like direction. So that could imply that even if it doesn't have a projecting nasal bone, it, it still might be more similar to humans. Yeah, I'm going to have to agree, by the way, here with Dapper. If it was easy to tell humans from non-humans, uh, it is indeed odd that there would be uh, disagreement. I'll push back like a little bit. Like any time that you're going to de define a boundary, you're always going to have some disagreement. But I, I, I do think that it, it, it really does seem like the, the I'm transition gonna push back does on seem pretty as, smooth to me. <laughs> I'm going to push back on that as well. Um, some evolutionists might like to make a big deal of this, that people, uh, creationists, disagree on things like Homo naledi. But if you think about it, I mean, first of all, there's a lot of evolutionary disagreement about exactly which taxa they fall into. Now, granted, they don't think there's such a hard boundary, but even within the clades, they, have, they can have difficulty telling where things fall. And then furthermore, creationists generally agree on the vast majority of things. They all agree That's... that Neanderthals are human. They all agree that Erectus is human. Do they, they all, all agree... agree that Neanderthals are human? Yes, I mean, all, all the respectable ones do, but do do all of them? That that you might be able to find I, random you're, people. You're I mean, right. like I, I know people who I shouldn't who put think... that on you. I shouldn't put that on you because you can find people who you can find people who agree with. So far, I have yet to find a uh, physics PhD who believes the Earth is flat, but <laughs> that will eventually happen. I'm it sure will eventually will. happen, and um, so you're right. I shouldn't. I shouldn't require yeah i mean my my I, I have family members who used to believe that um their dinosaurs were not real yeah so yeah. 
Yeah. All right. We shall push onward. All have heavy brow ridges, whereas humans typically do not have such pronounced brow ridges. However, uh, this is where the incredible variation we see in both humans and apes comes in. Uh, for example, in this 3D scan of a chimp's skull, the brow ridges are exceedingly small. Or in the... Yeah, I mean, um, there's kind of that variation with sexual dimorphism that we were talking about earlier that has a role on brow ridge development. Um, even male uh, modern humans tend to have a, a slightly more developed brow ridge, I believe, than... I'm pretty do. sure, like, I'm pretty sure my family, actually, the the men in my family, like, me and particularly one of my brothers has it more than the other, like, my eyes are are sort of, like, sunken in, like, I, I have a low brow, um, and, like, kind of a, a larger forehead, and they're, they're, my eyes are, like, kind of set far back, my brow doesn't really protrude from my skull, like, too much, but... I, I have like pretty recessed eyes. Like it, 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 it is a, you know, spectrum to some extent. So. Hmm. The Neanderthals among us. <laughs> <laughs> One uh, of us. <laughs> <laughs> and, and not to mention, of course. Yeah. He, he was just basically saying that it is a general generality that. Yeah. Which is fair, which is fair. Yeah. yeah. And yeah, there's all sorts of humans that have very, very well developed brow ridge. I mean, here is. By the way, I gotta say, it's a little concerning how many human skulls you just have behind you, <laughs> Rab. I mean, are, are you like Buffalo Bill or something going on here? Like, what's Maybe. going on? <laughs> <laughs> this is K and M E R three seven three three. It's uh, from Turkana, I believe. It's a homely erectus, and it's got massive brow ridges. Like these are yeah. some of the biggest brow ridges that you can see. Like, uh, let me, let me, let me yeah, expand that's this bigger. That like. Those That's are bigger than what he's got on screen. Yeah, it's bigger than you see in chimps and stuff sometimes. So well, yeah. I I mean I don't normally think of chimps as having like super huge huge brow ridges. They probably objectively do, as you're about to show me. I can see from the corner of my eye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here we go. Yeah, I mean... yeah, see, they they probably objectively do. But like what I think of when I think of brow ridges, what I think of is is Neander Neanderthal. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, um yeah, look at his nasal bones by the way. <laughs> yeah. Hey Joel. <laughs> oh yeah, Joel Duff is stopping by. Thanks for uh thanks for doing that. Have a good vacation. Ooh, board games. <laughs> I wonder what board games they're playing. Uh, you'll have to tell us. Yeah, I mean, um yeah, some of the very earliest uh members of Homo don't have very prominent brow ridges like Homo habilis and Homo rudolfensis. Uh, some specimens do, but some specimens don't have very pronounced brow ridges. So it's something that kind of becomes more developed later on within the human lineage as well. And Homo habilis, like Homo erectus, is also one of those that uh, there's sort of a f flexibility or a, a lot of different things that are sort of put within it. Yeah. So yeah. Com I'm... Compared to something like Homo sapiens, where I imagine we have a comparatively more precise. Uh, Right exactly. Here. Yeah. No, you're definitely right. Homo habilis tends to be a bit more just um sometimes fossils that are simply are are put Default. in there simply because of the time range. Okay, and a lot of yeah. them are very kind of not well preserved, so it's kind of hard to define exactly what Homo habilis is, especially postcranially. And the issue is that a lot of the stuff that we tend to find can be isolated, especially postcranially. So you'll have just random bits of bone that people will attribute to Homo habilis. But is it really Homo habilis? We have nothing else to compare it to, right? You first need a comparative baseline, which is what we've done with stuff like Lucy species. We have Lucy. We've got a full skeleton. So we can go out and find random isolated stuff and figure out if it belongs to the same species. But if we don't have a uh, well-preserved enough comparative baseline, we can't really do that sort of thing. Do we have a... Um how how precise of an idea do we have for how old lucy was when she died um if i remember correctly i believe she was a young adult um and we can look at that based on parts of her pelvis um such as her sacrum and how fused the vertebrae are 
And we also have her complete mandible and we can use that to look at like dental development. Yeah. That's what I thought. Okay. As a, as a quick side note relating to hominin development, Sea Science Film Labs once had a, <laughs> a discussion with me. They were claiming that um, Lucy was a five-year-old uh, because they apparently didn't know that bones fuse as they grow. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, I mean, humans are born with like <laughs> over 300 bones and then it fuses down to the low 200s, right? Yeah, yep. Mm-hmm. All right, are you ready to keep going? Let's do it. Case of the Aborigine skull. Notice the size difference compared to the North American Caucasian. Notice the elongation of the skull, the heavy, robust jawbone, and especially the brow ridges, which are often presented as proof of this person being the typical dumb brute Neanderthal. <laughs> this isn't uh, necessarily they? all Aboriginal peoples. Yeah. We have a few like isolated early crania that look kind of like this, um, but this is not also, something that's typical of them. Necessarily. Yeah. Also, I just want to say like the way he said that the uh, the the white you know Caucasian, it just rubbed <laughs> yeah. me slightly the wrong way. I don't I don't I don't want to ascribe anything to it, but I was like, really? Okay. <laughs> I feel like kind of that and pygmy. I don't know pygmy. I know some people have issues with it. I, I don't really like that term as much. I, I agree. I, I will say as a generic thing, I think that there is something to be said about uh, the the euphemism wheel. I'm mm -hmm. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's like wrong to do that. Yeah. Do you know what I mean by the euphemism wheel? Yeah. Yep. Like at, the, at a certain point in time, the word... It could be that in 200 right, it's just years, in the academic spinning. community, the word pygmy will be considered extremely offensive. Whereas right now, my understanding, and please correct me if I am wrong, um, is is that it is the correct, politically correct, academically precise word in certain contexts. Maybe? Or am I'm, I wrong? I'm not even, I'm not really sure about that. Yeah, see, um, like, I, I don't know, but yeah. I, I do think that it's it's one, like, kind of annoying when you have the euphemism wheel where, like, today's, today's euphemism, um, t today's politically correct term is tomorrow's um, slur. And yeah. that is a thing which I think does happen. My response is kind of, as, you know, a person with a lot of privilege, um, deal with it like I, it's it worse yeah. things can happen like exactly i yeah <laughs> just <laughs> deal yeah, with it no, i agree <laughs> yeah. like yeah it i feel like it you should just leave it up to the people more who are potentially going to say it rather than necessarily getting offended over it because people's intentions do matter yeah okay um, Dapper Dinosaur saying that's not an Aboriginal Australian skull. I I think it could be based off of something, but it it definitely looks weird. It looks more like vertically compressed to me. Here, we'll we'll back up a second if I can. Let's see. Even the um, teeth. Well, and then the it's human everything. skull, the, the modern human uh, Caucasian or whatever skull beneath it looks like it's like vertically. It, it looks like more vertically tall than it should be too. So they're, they're weird models. It's, definitely. it's a, it, like, yeah. Like I know that. I don't have sapiens that. Skull have globular head. skulls, but that's like straight up spherical. <laughs> yeah. They, all of those models look weird to me. So. Yeah. D definitely something as well. The heavy, robust jawbone and especially the brow ridges, which are often presented as proof of this person being the typical dumb brute Neanderthal. In fact, that name Neanderthal has become equated with being a dumb brute. This is an evolutionary preconception that could not be possibly farther from the truth. I have. It's true that people once used that as. A, an idea to argue that aboriginals were kind of like yeah. primitive and like there was a lot of atrocities committed against aboriginals that were horrible 
but you and I are that's both American. not necessarily. We are, we are very familiar with the idea of of uh, Caucasians committing atrocities against indigenous yeah. peoples, <laughs> and and um, yeah. I, but to relate that necessarily to evolution nowadays isn't really the case. I mean, it's everybody basically was racist at one time. All white Europeans were <laughs> racist at one time. So to say that this is somehow yeah. a uniquely special case isn't really the case. I will say, Dapper, I have, um, oh, oh, okay, you may not have used it, but I have heard it used. I have heard people call other people Neanderthals. Yes, I have as well. What, what Didn't Joe Biden call conservatives Neanderthals or something? I feel like I heard of that. Uh, dude, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> you know, I let's go, Brandon. <laughs> By the way, I mean, I'm, 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 I am, I'm sure compared to you, uh, a liberal and all of that and everything, but the whole let's go Brandon thing, I just think is objectively hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was funny how they were covering it, trying to cover it up, especially like when, yeah, it began. I, was like, I was like, just, just own it. Honestly, <laughs> it's... instead of just making it into a slogan. Yeah, just make make it into your slogan. You let them make it into their slogan. Just own it. Like, whatever. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Replica of probably the most famous Neanderthal skull. Cobway one or... That's not a Neanderthal skull, by the way. Um, That is actually something that's usually attributed to Homo heidelbergensis. Um, Some people attribute it to Homo rhodesianensis. But... There's too many... There's too many um species there's a lot yeah i i i'm trying to think here what are the main human species that i accept let me think here so obviously well, homo hold sapiens. on hold on before you start it might be it might be informative to have me give my take on it because okay go if, ahead if i do it before you start then you won't remind me okay Good. so i am aware of homo sapiens homo Neanderth- neanderthalensis um De- denisovans it's not homo denisovans right they haven't it's been attributed just, to their own they haven't because yet. they've only got like it's a pretty small amount but we have like a weird amount of evidence along certain th- like we have a lot of genetic evidence yeah because basically okay. what that team there is doing is they're just finding little tiny bits of bone and, and yeah uh, and sequencing the genetics from them which is pretty hardcore and then, okay, so we've got those. Then Homo erectus is another big one that I'm familiar with. And before that would be Homo habilis, another huge one. And then, yeah, I've, I, I'm familiar more with like Homo heidelbergensis, which I think is more in the vicinity of erectus and Neanderthal. Yes. Uh-huh. Um, that could possibly be the last common ancestor of humans and Neanderthals. Okay, um, and then I've heard of Georgicus, but I don't know if I would have remembered it if it hadn't come up earlier in the stream. Um, I Ergaster, I may have remembered if it hadn't come up earlier in the stream. Um, Heidelbergensis, we well, I already went over. Um, Naledi is the other really big one. Yeah. Uh, and that is the one of all of those. No, um, Sediba. It's not it, it, the the general um, accepted one is is Australopithecus Sediba. But there's there's some people, and I think you're one of them, that think it should be Homo, or not. Possibly. So or, I'm I'm kind of tentative on that. Um, some evidence has suggested it's Homo, but uh, some of the evidence I'm actually going to be presenting at the conference is indicative that um we might have been wrong about that we'll see i don't know i i think if it i think it is the most homo like of the australopithecines and if it's not that it's the most australopithecus like of the homo group so yeah i'm not sure exactly about what exactly australopithecus sediba is and, and there's disagreements, obviously, within evolutionary taxonomy, too, as whether it is basal to Homo or whether it is a side branch to, like, Africanus or something like that. 
So, so um, Africanus is after Afarensis, right? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Afarensis is the. Yeah, it goes. Animensis is the earliest Australopithecines, then Afarensis, then Africanus, and then Sediba. Okay. Yep. Um, let's see. So the the tax that I would accept as human would be Sapiens, Homo neanderthalensis, Homo heidelbergensis, Homo naledi, Homo habilis. In terms of like early Homo, I'm not actually sure how many species there are, but like early Homo, it's something. Homo floresiensis, Erectus. Oh, right. And then, I like, forgot about that one. Yeah. Oh yeah, floresiensis. Yeah, the the, the Hobbit, and then maybe Sediba. So. So maybe eight, maybe maybe a couple more, and then Denisovans. I don't know. I'm not certain that they're their and, own species. And but. and all of those, um, you and I think I um, would say are w would probably have been inter inter fertile. At least maybe they their children wouldn't have been fertile, but um, actually maybe. maybe not. Maybe I wouldn't say that. I don't know so that, we I have wanna, evidence that, that I want to commit myself to that. I don't know. Yeah, we, we do have evidence that there might have been reproductive barriers between um, Homo hmm. sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis. We, and and if, if that existed, if that then exists, like the, you think home, all, you, the other one, modern? yeah, Habilis and sapiens, oh, but, but Habilis and sapiens in, in the mainstream perspective didn't coexist, right? Yeah. Yes. Okay. And I'm not certain that they did either. I don't know. Um, but but yeah, if that that's pretty interesting. If we're already finding burials at or sorry, um uh barriers. Uh yes, yeah, sorry. <laughs> barriers between the closest thing to us, there might have been some bigger uh barriers as well between further things. All right, I will get the stream going again. For the broken hill skull. Found in a cave in 1921, we are told it is 299,000 years old. The prominent brow ridges are what catches most people's attention and what most people consider an indication that this person was subhuman or a dumb brute. Now, they were anything but stupid. A major preconception that people are falsely led to believe is that brain size is an indicator of intelligence. That is correct. Yeah, and this is something that has I I, I know that um, Erica's recent videos about the um, uh, Naledi finds are th this is exactly the thing that that is potentially being really challenged in a major yeah. way is brain case size being a as reliable a direct proxy for more complex, sophisticated uh, cognitive processes that would be required for something as culturally loaded and symbolic as, as burial. Yeah. So that kind of all started as like this evolutionary idea that brain size basically could just be proportionate to intelligence so that as people evolved to get bigger brains, intelligence just evolved right along with that. But Homo naledi really throws a monkey wrench into that. And that's kind of what I would expect from a creationist perspective, that even if since I'm finding that these things are human, I'm expecting that they're going to show complex behaviors. And so Naledi is kind of a confirmation of that. Um, and interestingly, Naledi may be, there's disagreement about it. It's either one of the very earliest branches on the human family tree, or it's kind of like a branch off around the time of Heidelbergensis. So yeah. either way, it's 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 pretty yeah, ancient branch within the Homo family tree. So I would push back and say I don't see why there would be so many branches under a special creation point of view or a young creation point of view, just generically. That that seems um, that seems like a a subsequent like it's not necessarily like preclusionary against that but it's not what you would expect i would sort of expect from why wouldn't a you younger expect that why would there be why would there be so such dramatic anatomical differences so recently that we i that i feel like so for me um i think this coincides well 
so in, in my perspective, I guess, I kind of see this the same way that I would see something like, um, um, you know, these other various kinds of creatures radiating after the flood. So, they, for example, did they radiate that fast? Well, I think well, that, that I don't is think they the can radiate that fast, I guess. So <laughs> I think that's that's the major thing right there, whether the time places a a limit on exactly how fast yeah. that can happen, which it does. And creationists are trying to explore ways in which things can happen faster than conventionally understood. But I don't think that's very settled yet. And I, I will I will acknowledge that um, it you can have dramatic evolutionary um, change over geologically instantaneous time periods. Yeah, like it, that that is possible. We, I mean, like an example it, of that like, is well evolution. Well, evolution was, happens. Was that ge crazy. geologically instantaneous? <laughs> no, I'm not saying it's instantaneous, but that happens I, crazy fast compared to like the speciation okay. rate of like these other groups. When you look at like phylogenetics, whales they have to speed up the rate of evolution for whales compared to other sorts of creatures because that happens yeah. within a pretty short amount of time to go from a land dwelling creature to a whale. Yeah. The most aggressive um, time frames that I'm sort of vaguely familiar with would be um well i mean canines obviously but canines there's a whole other thing going on there <laughs> yeah um, no that's so fascinating especially like how domestication influences yeah. that it's just mind-blowing it, it, it's 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 blitz uh the marbled crayfish i'm not Are i'm familiar not familiar with, with that no so the marbled crayfish is a a very atypical example um, of extremely rapid genetic change. It was first observed, as I understand it, in the early 90s in the aquarium pet trade. I believe it is a saltwater, I believe, um, crayfish or something. And it was almost, it, it's, it's widely believed to have been a very recent novel mutation that resulted in a parthenogenic crayfish. All marbled crayfish are female. They all have the same number of chromosomes, which is an odd number, interestingly, because they're parthenogenic. Yeah, exactly. Um, they're all female. They're all parthenogenic. And they have spread extremely rapidly as an invasive species within um, the, the aquarium pet trade and into wild environments now. And they were first observed in the early 90s suggesting that it's probably a pretty recent thing hmm. uh so i i find it a fascinating thing i don't know how much but yeah it's... yeah Doctor, I, I, Doc so like uh um taxonomically and in terms of its body structure i don't know that it is particularly different from its where yeah. it came from, which they can probably determine with almost no question if if I'm correct about sure. the time frame. Um, but so yeah. Joel Duff says, if other kinds can diversify so quickly, it would be logical to say that homo kind could also diversify quickly, even if yeah. I think it doesn't make sense. But, I, I think you're right that yeah. only only if though only if all of these different kinds are diversifying using the same mechanisms. And this is where so this is where I would say like um, you've probably seen um, some of Erica's recent stuff uh, responding to what's his name the guy who's SFT? been not SFT. Okay. Um, the guy with the genetics that says the eighty-four percent. Oh, Tompkins. Tompkins, yeah, she's there's there's been an um, I mean, she's got a lot of content on Tompkins, but in in the last month or so, there's been a a, a few different some some awesome long streams. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and I lost my train of thought slightly. Uh, Rapid speciation. Yeah, no, I was gonna say so. He is of the opinion that the the genetic difference between humans and chimpanzees is more like between 84 and 89 percent um and that because of that we cannot be the same created kind 
And I think that Erica has demonstrated pretty convincingly, if she didn't mess up, that under those same um, criteria, that 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 same procedure, mm-hmm. then like Homo sapiens one aren't 100 percent similar to themselves, which if you're using the same reference genome, yeah. you should probably get <laughs> within a rounding error of that, right? Like, <laughs> um, and, and also just that um, it it's not uh, tigers and lions are the example, or or or. Well, I think she was even cats. pointing to more distantly related things. Yeah, the point, she, the point is can. that there are things which are. Um, like 80% similar to each other, which creationists are saying are related to each other. So mice and rats, maybe, I don't know. Like it it could be. Um, But, but her point is simply that if we're using 80% as the cutoff for different kinds, then creationists have to believe in a a lot more things being grouped together than they do. Yeah. And I, I think that the, the most valid the the steel man counter argument to that would be that you you can't select a single number as the cutoff which i would agree with i think of all things that are available to us it's probably the one that is the most reliable if if gun to your head you had to select one criterion probably that sort of genetic sequencing would be the criterion i would think yeah, I mean, what what I would say simply is that different kinds can diversify at different rates. That's they true. could have been yeah. more speciose before the fall, right? Um, they could have had multiple members of the created kind on board the ark in the case of clean kinds, where they had seven or 14 um, aboard the seven ark. Seven pairs, yeah. Yeah, well, there's there's disagreement Which... about that translation, but... Really? Oh. Yes. Um, and then oh, the I didn't other... Know that. Why would yeah. you bring why would you bring seven and not seven pairs? <laughs> no, I, I'm sorry. It's not seven. It's either fourteen or so it's either like seven pairs or it's seven times seven, I think. I, I, I'm I'm blanking uh, out okay, right at the moment, but there's four. something like that. People aren't I aren't quite clear on that. Okay. So yeah, so I, I feel like we first we would really need to nail down exactly how this rapid biological diversification is happening before we could make arguments about exactly how distinct things have to be to be in the same kind genetically. Oh, interesting. Sea science has uh, uh, um, chimed in and, and stated that they believe that uh, tigers and lions were created initially separately. Do you believe that they were represented independently on the arc then? Because then I think we start to run into overcrowding concerns. Yes. I mean, there's also things to do with um, uh, hybridization as well that to me then don't really make much sense, right? If these are separate created kinds, why can they hybridize? And if they can hybridize, why does no one need to bring both aboard the ark, right? Because he could just bring one from each species. And if they're able to hybridize, he wouldn't need two pairs. You would need a pair of lions and a pair of tigers. Yep. So, yeah, I, I have some disagreements. Uh, the Byzantine Scotus points out that numbers in the Bible frequently have both symbolic and literal meaning because the real word conveys symbolic meaning. So, yeah, I wonder what's going on with the seven there. I'm guessing it has something to do with the idea of fullness and completion, but that'd be interesting to, to look into. All right. Uh, his next claim is going to is going to blow your mind. Oh. Uh, what are your my views, views? So I I do happen to be an atheist. Um, I am a I, I, I'm a scientist. I'm a physicist. I subscribe to all of the sort of typical mainstream positions. Um, I I don't want to come across here as somebody who who is pretending to be an expert on things that I am emphatically not. But yeah, that is that is my position is. Sea Science Very, Films yeah. Lab says that tigers and lions were both present on the Ark in my model. Hmm. Okay. All right, let's keep going with the video. This is founded in the evolution myth because we supposedly evolved 
from less intelligent apes who have smaller brains on average. Now, if you recall, I'm a member of Mensa, the International High IQ Society. To be a member, you have to score in the top 2% of the general population on an IQ test. This makes it really surprising, some of the mistakes he's going to make later on. Uh, I mean, <laughs> yes and no. I, no, I, I've, I've heard that IQ tests aren't a good indicator of intelligence. I don't know exactly how true that is. I, but... I, I will say, I, how many, do we have better ones? That, that's I'm like, sure. are, are they great? They're, no, not in all situations. They're measuring something. They're not measuring complete randomness, okay? Yeah. Like, Einstein is going to score higher on an IQ test than... <sighs> I'm trying to think of somebody who I can call dumb without being at all offensive. Um, Joe Biden. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay. Uh, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene. Can we do that? Sure. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> Donald Trump. I, Einstein yeah. is smarter than Trump, <laughs> <laughs> and and Donald Trump's uncle, um, was a was my grandfather's first uh PhD student. And Donald Trump's his, uncle. Donald Trump's uncle. If, if <laughs> so, if you go to Michael Granado's <laughs> channel, where um I did a I did an interview, and it was mostly about my grandfather. And his relationship, weirdly enough, with Donald Trump's uncle. He so back in the 30s, um, he was Donald Trump's uncle. John G. Trump was my grandfather's first um, advisee, first PhD student. And then later, they became very close friends. They were both on the faculty at MIT, and they founded a company, High Voltage Engineering Corporation, that <laughs> produced Van de Graaff generators for m mostly for like um, cancer treatment, like um, proton radiation therapies, mm. um, are are probably the most common modern day application of Van de Graaff generators. They're not as much used as as research particle accelerators anymore okay. uh but yeah donald trump's uncle was it, it, i view it as a personal responsibility as one a physicist and two a van de graaff and therefore the the physicist on the planet with possibly the most connection to donald trump's uncle to preserve <laughs> john trump's reputation in the community because i will i will tell you Donald Trump and the Trump family do not have a great reputation in, in my uh, community, as <laughs> I'm sure does not surprise you. But his uncle was – he was a kind man. He was a humble man, and he really cared enormously about um, a people – and about science. So, yeah, I'll get off my soapbox well, now. You can't, you can't really say the same about humility for Trump, can you? No, you cannot. Sea <laughs> uh, Science Film Labs comments, the variation since the arc in my model is purely the different colors of tigers and lions. Dude, it, you, there's too much genetics to say well, that. Well, I, I still think hybrids throw some problems in there, but why just the colors? I mean, we have... It, we have um we have there there is like morphological variation within tigers i mean there's multiple species of tigers multiple species of lions and i'm i'm sure there are some morphological differences there so you've got to have some morphological variation not just color yeah also that doesn't support sea sciences position as i understand it their position as i understand it is that they're they they were two distinct kinds why would their difference solely be their colors if they were two distinct kinds it would i be think he was saying they're distinct kinds but then after the flood all they do is just change color at least that's okay, how i'm interpreting that... it okay i don't know okay i will roll the video certified genius well if i am a certified genius and brain size indicates intelligence then neanderthal man must have been a super genius except he's not holding a neanderthal remember this is homo heidelbergensis or homo radiziensis which actually has a smaller brain uh let's see i have it here 
Yeah, it's 1,280 cubic centimeters, which is smaller than the Neanderthal average and the modern human average. So Yeah, but I mean, on screen, I'm not sure it's much smaller than him. It's a little smaller than him. It's a little smaller than him. Yeah, I, I don't... <laughs> I, I, just, I, I had to make the joke, you know? Because <laughs> his brain case is larger than mine. See, it's he not. made the joke. <laughs> <laughs> Frankly, the idea that brain size is related to intelligence is a bankrupt notion, and the idea that Neanderthal man was less intelligent than we are today is also a bankrupt notion. I agree. I think that Neanderthals were as smart as we are. And I think there's a lot of cultural evidence to back that up. And within the field of paleoanthropology, that's going to take a long time to change that conception, but there are a number of different people who are already kind of moving in this direction. Yeah. So. So my understanding is that in, in the field, it is an open question. If Neanderthals could even speak, like if they had verbal language, which yeah. my intuition would be like, uh, they, they must. Well, would be yeah, I, I, I think there is good evidence that they were, for example, we've looked at the hyoid bone and they've done CT scans of the hyoid bone, which basically anchors your tongue. So what they've looked at is the internal structure. And from what I know, it appears that it's developed in the same way that a human has, which basically placing stress on it in specific locations using speech, which indicates that they are probably relying on making these sort of sounds in a similar way to us. And there's been some reconstructions of like the Neanderthal vocal tract and stuff like that, that have suggested that they might've been more similar to like juvenile uh, human modern people. But yeah. I bring this up to expose any preconceptions that Neanderthal man was a dumb brute. Even if he was living in a cave, so what? King Saul and King David both spent an awful lot of time in caves. No one would say they were less intelligent because of that. But this Neanderthal skull has a strange clean hole in the side. <laughs> There's actually a path of holes through the skull to a larger fractured hole. The path entry and exit. Um, one question, one moment here, a question from Byzantine Scottish. If Homo sapiens were interbreeding them, do we really think they couldn't communicate? So I don't think they couldn't communicate. I think they could. Um, but I'm saying based as far as we can go just on the physical evidence, it's it, not it's, like overwhelming at this point. No, I think it points it in this be. direction, but I'm saying in just in terms of what we have in terms of physical evidence, we can't like definitively prove it, but I suspect it to be the case. I, I think what we're going to need is we're going to need cultural, um, uh, paleontol paleontological cultural evidence, similar to what we have, what we may have found with Naledi, right? But we do have Neanderthal burials. I mean, everything but, we have but, got from yeah, Naledi, we've got from Neanderthals. Y yes, I, I agree. Okay. okay. I, I agree, but, but, that we're not the, the evidence that we have for Naledi, we're not saying implicates speech. Mm, it, maybe, maybe we I'm... are. May, maybe we are. Maybe speech, re, maybe burial rites require speech. I would actually be somewhat amenable to that position. I, I for the record, I think Neanderthals could speak. It just, it seems way more parsimonious I think than the cave alternative. paintings are also an interesting it, possibility yes. as well if we see if Homo Naledi was really making engravings that implies abstract thought kind of yeah. making designs intentionally and that to me is very connected to forming ideas and and speech because the problem with Homo Naledi or Neanderthals wasn't physical capacity yeah. at least for Neanderthals we know they would have been capable of doing it. the question is whether they did well, and that's interesting because to me, it's sort of, I would assume that as soon as they could, they did, because mm -hmm. the reason that you would go from barely being able to speak to being able to speak is that as soon as you, as soon as there's a little bit there that natural selection can hold on to, it becomes useful and selected for, and you're going to develop that pretty quickly uh, yeah. would be would be my um intuition for and it the brain 
ties into this all too. So Holman Naledi has an area enlarged here, which we don't see enlarged in australopithecines and is related mm -hmm. to um, speech. Uh, Joel Duff also points out there's something called the Fox P2 gene, uh, which is kind of famous for appearing in Neanderthals, and it's related to speech as well. Mm. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know anything about that. Yeah, if somebody should do a, uh, or they should link me to if it already exists, um, a, a nice in-depth video on the topic. I yeah. can't imagine. I'm working on an article right now, but it might be a while till it's finished. Okay. <laughs> this is. Well, Joel Duff has so much content that I that I haven't seen yet. <laughs> I know. It, Joel Duff's channel is a treasure trove of uh, awesomeness. <laughs> yeah. He says anthropological evidence seems much more compelling to me. Yeah, I agree that considering yeah, either bones speech. or just anatomy isn't isn't the way to go. We need to do both because we have a clear prediction as creationists. If something falls in the human category in our baromenological analyses, we ought to see evidences of culture in it, right? So we have a clear prediction there. The exact creatures which are within the human holobrahman ought to be the same ones in which we see complex activity and behavior for the first time. So it's really important to combine those two. And I guess the evolutionary perspective would be that, um, uh, or I guess, let me, how do I want to put this? You wouldn't expect to see, you would expect to see a pretty wide gulf between um, animals, apes capable of speech and those that aren't. And you wouldn't expect to see really a transition between them. Would, uh, there's no maybe. reason a priori too. I'm not saying I'm not saying it precludes it, but why would that exist? Well, I, I guess if you're going to view it more like the behave, the evolution of traits, um, you could view it more as not like a thing that just suddenly comes about, but more as something which starts being relied on more over time. Yeah, and I think that I, 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 which I in which case there would be there wouldn't be a gap. Supported. Exactly, I don't think there would be a gap. Okay, um, okay. I was mistaking you for saying. Yeah, that no, no. I was, uh, the evolutionary perspective would would criticize the uh, creationist perspective because. In, in my view, the creationist perspective would anticipate a pretty distinct gap, whereas the evolutionary perspective would um, not anticipate a clear, distinct gap. Yeah. So, like, if if you had a small amount of, of um, cultural evidence for going back, and I don't think we do, maybe we do, I have no idea, um, all the way back to... Um, Sihilanthropus chidensis, for example, if if you already started to see, maybe if it, if if they had little like knickknacks or things, and then that was a, a very clear progression, and then Australopithecus got more, and then late Australopithecus got more, and then it, like it would all sort of transition. And... I mean, part of the difficulty of this is we just cannot attribute. Uh, um stone tools and that sort of stuff to a particular species most of the time that's true and that, that true. just makes it really difficult most, most of the time but not necessarily all of the time not all the time neanderthals and erectus we've got some pretty clear examples by the, and there's by been the way, some claims lately about like paranthropus possibly yeah by the way um i don't know if this ever i i don't know if you ever got um any responses to your videos? I remember you did some videos on the the stone tool argument that our our friend Joel Duff here, I believe, was sort of the the, the YouTube pioneer at least. Was um, that where? I, I if I understand he correctly, on his like, blog on it. Okay, on his blog, and then and then Erica made um, that, yeah. a bite sized bust about it. Yeah, and um, I will say I thought your uh, criticisms of that were pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it, it all comes down to how we estimate things. And they were making some assumptions that were, we're kind of assuming their, their point already. Yeah, yeah exactly. Um, the Byzantine Scotus says, I'm also of the philosophical opinion that though language would be impossible, that without a rational immaterial soul. Um, I agree that language, I guess, would be, but not speech. I mean, we have right. things like parrots, right, that can still talk. Um, 
but I think the developing of a complex language, I, I agree. You don't owe me anything, Jolda, but uh, we, I, uh, we talked honestly, about it a little bit. But. I, I feel like he maybe does. I think you made some <laughs> very good points in that video. Um, I, I thought your your overall argument, I'm much less familiar with uh, the, the, the individual facts that your argument and Joel and Erica's argument was based off of, but from fr basically everything are... I know about it, I, I learned from all y'all's videos. <laughs> I think the, the major point is if Duff is correct, he has to estimate the number of stone tools in a different way. Yes. I, that's, yes. That's the that very baseline. My, th that was my sort of position was the way you're getting that number of like over a trillion, right? It was in the tri 15 trillion or something. Yeah. It? It's like the only way you're getting that number is by I assume multiplying a million years. by a, a long period of time yeah yeah so yeah but then i also the whole thing about multiple archaeological layers yeah we really we really to, to answer this we would really have to come up with where um sediments where humans have deposited tools are and then what the average stone tool density is per cubic meter yeah that's what we would really need to know but and and then the the amount like when you consider local um geologic preservation factors erosion I, I it's a very hard thing to estimate yeah um, and then the other thing is all of the places that they were doing at or like estimating the number of stone tools were all like famous paleoanthropological sites where people yeah. are drawn simply because there were tools there so yeah it's, it's just not a legitimate way of, of i thought yeah i thought you were i thought you made yeah okay well thank you <laughs> Exit wounds sure match those made by a bullet, a 28 caliber bullet to be precise. Arrows, spears, and rocks. A 28 caliber. <laughs> Wait, so does he think this guy got shot in the head? Yes, he does. Oh my god. Do you, do you think that it's even plausible that this person got shot with any intentional projectile? Um. Um. Okay, so what. I, I do know about this is that from the most recent studies of this that were published in 2018, um, they, they micro CT scanned the skull for the first time. And what they found was that the damage appeared to be post-mortem. Yeah. So okay. it doesn't seem like the person was killed by something that was killed by this particular thing. So a lot of the early speculation about this came from the idea that this was some sort of a lesion that was pathological, so a disease, um, or related to an ear infection or something like that. But a lot of that skull? seems to have been debunked. In the skull? Yeah, apparently there's a, a number of different other features of the skull that have been interpreted as pathological as well. I didn't know that you could get lesions that cause a, a nice round hole in your skull. There are. I, I was looking at some okay. previously, but well. that doesn't appear to be the case here. This appears to be post-mortem. Yeah, Dolda, he's clarifying that it is uh, the debitage, the, the pieces, but yeah. Yeah, which, yeah, fair enough. Yeah, you're right. That, and that also, I think, was something that... But flakes are still pretty yeah. distinctive as well, but yeah. Which which surprises me. I wouldn't have expected that. That was something I learned from from all those. I was like, yeah, apparently they you can identify the flakes. And I was like, oh. Yeah, that did not seem obvious to me. It, <laughs> okay, I mean, rocks yeah. fall on other rocks all the time. Like, yes, they don't. You're not lapping them as precisely, but yeah, yeah. Okay, have a good night, Jolda. Thanks for stopping by. Rods do not typically leave the same wounds as a bullet. Now, while I'm open to alternative explanations, frankly, I'm not at all convinced by any of them. I would stick with Occam's shaver and the simplest, most obvious explanation. It's a bullet wound. Okay. That's not so, the simplest, most obvious explanation. No, it's not. Also, <laughs> that angle, that bullet, like, I don't think a bullet would make that hole unless it was going perpendicular to the surface. Not to mention, if you look at the other side of the skull, there's actually a number of different holes. So that, that hole yeah. on the bottom of the skull is not the only hole 
in the skull. So I don't think we can necessarily say that that hole on the bottom of the skull was caused by something going through there. Yeah. Because there's a whole chunk out of the other side of the skull that nobody's claiming came from a bullet. <laughs> okay, but obviously this is not the simplest explanation. We have no evidence that guns were around early after the flood. <laughs> Yeah. Or that these sort of people ever interacted with guns. So this is not the most obvious explanation at all. Yeah, I have no like guns are mentioned um how many places in the Bible? <laughs> yeah, uh, that's what I thought. <laughs> well, just where a gun control is prohibited. <laughs> uh... Uh... I've missed Shooting your channel, Peter. Is the... What? I've missed your channel, Peter. Oh. <laughs> the cave would typically shatter the skull, not produce a nice, clean hole. So I've looked at some gunshot wounds, and I'm not certain that uh, bullets typically produce nice holes anyway. So... They can. Um, they don't they have can... to. I have no idea. Okay. Because a lot of the a lot of what I've seen documented is that they cause a lot of cracks. Like it's not just a nice little round hole. I think it's one of these things that can go all over the place. And to me, yeah. what that looks like is he measured that hole, and that hole has the radius of like a twenty-two caliber thing. Therefore, it was caused by a twenty-two caliber thing. I, that's, that's not, not how convincing. logic worked. <laughs> yeah, that's not convincing. Um, I. It's not obvious to me that that is how holes do. I think that this is one of these areas where you could do oh you could do uh, laboratory science. Um, it'd be a little grisly, I suppose, um, <laughs> to to really you know figure out quantitatively exactly how likely this is. Yeah, and I'm not certain. I, he also claimed that if it was happened after the skull was already dead, it would have shattered. But yeah, that's, the evidence that's seems only to true see... if it's way later, right? Like if, it, I, if I'm it's not if it's dead and dried out and, and brittle, then yeah. But if it's dead and then two minutes later you shoot it, biomechanically it's going to behave identically. Yeah. Um, so I I think if you were going to make this claim, you'd have to have more evidence that this that like shooting it later wouldn't fracture it in in those sort of ways. Yeah. I, yeah. 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 <laughs> but this would be shown in a living bone. Now, maybe Neanderthal man had guns and such technology way back then, or perhaps this skull is nowhere near as old as it was purported to be. Except for that to be true, then there's a lot of things like um, the radiometric dates, which don't make any sense then. Well, and such such as the also some of the morphology of the fossil as well so if that's correct i'm saying that the radiometric dates aren't even correct like relative to one another yeah because i think that radiometric honestly, dates are, I, are correct relative to each other and that's interesting i i see from a from a sort of a high level i see how you can kind of make that work i I think that you have a big problem with radiometric dates. Peter. I do. Yeah. And I I think um yeah, you you know that. And I mean cuz we basically need accelerated radiometric decay. And, and in some very particular ways, right? Yeah. Or you need other solutions that well, you you have been asked <laughs> out you have been asked outright um, at least once that I know specifically and can remember, but probably at least three times that I've seen. Um, okay. And you you have um, stated that the heat problem is not solved. There does not yeah. exist a, a solution to it currently. Um, there's solutions if, that could hypothetically work, but there's absolutely no testable evidence that they are even, that they are plausible or correct at all. Yes, and they would require. They're I'd be testable. interested to know what those. I would be interested to know what those would be because solutions in terms of of um, facts about the laws of physics that your typical secular scientist would agree with 
if you limit yourself only to that, then then I don't, then I don't the think case. it's possible. It's no, certainly, you're right. Yeah, you're right. It's, no, it's there's, just not there's possible. There's claims as like they they rate um, team makes the some claims team, yeah. about about like um, the like fourth dimensional expansion of space, letting heat into it, and like stuff like that. Yeah. Which I I have no way. I mean, that is obviously very far fetched. It, well, it, it's it, it's at least it, it, that would be so cool, though. <laughs> That'd be but, so cool. Like, though. why would it suddenly work then? I mean, there's a there's like because why God said that... so. I I think the I think fundamentally the okay. issue is that the happen the flood happened in Scripture, for example. Um, again, atheist here. I do not. So you hmm. know, my opinion of Scripture is what it is. Um, but to me. In, in scripture, the flood happened because God said it happened. F therefore, I'm, uh, well, like, just I, bite I the think bullet the, and have a miracle. <laughs> well, I think the timing of the flood was miraculous, but I'm not so convinced that... It kind of depends how you approach it, right? Because I think there are possible mechanisms which could possibly initiate the flood as we know it, as creationists have typified it. And so okay. I think it could be possible that there wasn't like divine intervention to start the flood. Now God would still have ordained the flood, but yeah. I, so I, I would like to state sort of publicly here. I would love to do like a regular show with you where like you try and convince me because I've told you this before. It's in writing. You've got it somewhere. If <laughs> anybody on this planet is going to convince me to be a young earth creationist it's you at this point in time you're you're the only one that Not has Ken a, i mean stunningly <laughs> stunningly I, I was with him until the fourth wife i gotta say and then <laughs> no kent hoven is a criminal and a lunatic <laughs> and true uh, I I think I, I, I have a track record of interacting um, with people that I respect. <laughs> so uh, and I, I don't respect it... Kent Hovind. So. <laughs> sometime I what sometime so I have been working on some videos about radiometric dating. Um, you helped me on some actually. Uh, yeah. he was he was giving me some advice uh, for a separate thing which I haven't really revealed publicly yet. It's not on this channel, but it's going to be videos for me going up elsewhere. So, yeah. Um, but I, I would one thing I would like to do, and I have considered, is possibly reaching out to some of the people on the rate team because I think it'd be really interesting to interview them and kind of talk about some of the stuff. It'd be interesting I, to, if I could do that to also get somebody else to kind of critique them who also knows more about physics. I have, I have thought so. Like, if I were to make content on my channel. I would probably start by responding to um, Jason Lyle because he's more recent and has more stuff. Um, what about his work? Oh, I I mean, pro I'd probably just find something. I mean, okay. uh, generically <laughs> speaking, there's there's like a lot. Um, he's less bad than than typical. He he has a better track record about staying sort of yeah i i Mar think Mar he seems Mar like a pretty good guy 81 did did some stuff on him which was of a tone that was more emphatic than i would be but which i couldn't necessarily disagree with hmm. um, I'll, I'll have to check that out I'm, I'm yeah it was i i mean he, they they were calling jason lyle a liar for because there are some things that he obje he should know these things I have hmm. a PhD in physics. He has a PhD in physics. Um, he has a PhD in astrophysics. And I think that some of the things he was saying. What about distant starlight or what? Uh, I, I can't, that's the okay. issue is now okay. I'm, I'm <laughs> I, now I've made an accusation against somebody and I don't <laughs> right now I'm sort of frozen and I don't have the specifics to back it up. And I feel somewhat embarrassed about that. Okay. That's so... fine. We'll play the video. Um, I think we're going to skip ahead a little bit. Um, there's a lot of information that keeps going on here. Um, 
And I want to get to a certain part here. Um, let's see. So we're going to skip ahead a little ways since this is taking us a while, which is good. Um, By the way, yeah, this this is the first time you've this done is one fun. of these, right? Yeah, yeah no, this is, it, this is totally This is fun. how these go. I, if you've ever just sat down and watched one of Dapper shows the entire two hours, <laughs> today, for example, in today's stream, he got eight and a half minutes done. Oh, my. Well, we, we will beat him at the very least. Yeah. Did not worry Don and Tim. Now, this, of course, isn't the only time Johansson and the team did this. Okay, um, so for clarification here, he's talking about the species Australopithecus afarensis. And basically, very early on, they were finding bones at two different locations. Hadar, which is up in Ethiopia, and then Laetoli, which is down in Tanzania. And the people who were excavating down at Laetoli believed that their fossils were human. And the people who were up excavating up at Hadar didn't think that their fossils were human. And basically, they looked at the fossils from the people that the people were finding at Laetoli and were like, oh, those look pretty similar to our fossils. I think they all belong in the same species. And, and that is the context. Okay. Thank you. A fossil knee joint was found by Johansson's team that was attributed to Afarensis. I would like to note here that he is holding the knee joint upside down, which bodes very well for his anatomical <laughs> knowledge. <laughs> he has the tibia on the you, top okay, and then so he has the femur underneath, it looks like. I'm pretty sure I'm pretty sure you meant to say he has the the tibula on the oh, top. Oh I, I sorry, I, I meant to say <laughs> that, yes. <laughs> It's fibia and tibula. Thank you very yes. much. <laughs> Listen carefully to what anatomist Owen Lovejoy says in the Nova PBS special about the fossil knee that was found and attributed to Lucy. So this is the AL129 knee joint, and they found this um, a couple of kilometers away from Lucy, but they attribute it to the species, and he's taking issue with that because this knee joint shows some features which shows that it walked upright, and he doesesn't want that to be true for Australopithecines because they're apes. When Don brought the head our knee back from Ethiopia, he brought it over to my house and laid it out on the living room carpet, and I knew instantly that was a human knee. Now, this is all before they actually named the species Australopithecus afarensis. So they didn't really have a category to put it in at that time, first of all. And second of all, this isn't a human knee. I mean, there are features of it um, that are not human. So like when we look at the side view, looking at the condyles, which are those round parts that articulate with the tibia, uh, humans have very like oval shaped condyles. This one is kind of in between a chimp and a human. Chimps have like more rounded condyles. AL129 has kind of an intermediately oval condyles. Um, if we look at the intercondylar outline, which is when we look at it from the bottom, it appears different from humans. There's just some various features which don't seem like it's a human. Not to mention it's like identical to Lucy's knee. So, yeah. How do you spell condyles? Oh, uh, C-O-N-D-Y-L-E. You can you, let's watch the video. Okay. <laughs> Johansson and Lovejoy demonstrate that they know it's a human knee because it locks upright. Eight knees can't lock upright like yours can. And guess what? I totally agree with them. That is a fossil human knee. However, they then go on to use that fossil knee to interpret the Lucy fossils and build up the case that Lucy walked upright. Except Lucy has her own knee. So. We don't really need the AL129 knee as proof that Lucy walked up, right? So. so you're saying that they looked at a knee and they didn't just go, oh, hey, it's identical to this other thing, and then pointed at an empty spot on the figure where it listed Lucy? You're well, they actually that... found it a whole year before Lucy. Well, okay. But, yeah. I mean, maybe they were So they didn't really know what it belonged to. And then they came back and re-began excavations. They're like, hey, this thing looks pretty similar to what we found before. I bet they're the same yeah. species. Uh, one thing I actually do like to do when people show um, skeletons of Lucy is is point out whether they've got missing pieces or not. That, that does not look very full at all. I it's feel not. 
I, I feel um, like I've seen I've seen like the canonical sort of photographs of Lucy, and there's way more to it. <laughs> well, I think the thing that adds the most bulk to that is ribs. There's more ribs than he has there, I believe. Um, and then the other main thing that I'm recognizing here is that he's cutting off the foot. So on that right yeah. foot there, there is a pedal phalange and yeah yeah something else? that was a, i was like yeah. there, isn't there like a whole foot or something missing there, there's and not like, a whole foot there's a few bones like, he has the talus like, on there but there's some there's at least well, one of what, other bone of what down we there. have of what we have i didn't mean whole foot is like an entire okay. attack foot. i meant like the whole part of what we have from lucy that is the foot sure. which is only good yeah i like, know there's like at if least you got another... rid of if you got rid of the femur i would say that's missing the whole leg because <laughs> yeah let's see that's here. the I'll... whole leg of what we got i've got a picture of lucy here let me uh share my screen there we go um yeah so here we can see there is an additional skull fragment that doesn't appear on his uh on his model um and then there are, he had only three rows of ribs, I believe. Uh, yeah. Isn't and he missing like a long one? Maybe at the bottom. No, maybe not. He, he's missing a number of ribs. And then you can see down here at the foot, there are uh, two toe bones that he's missing as well. Interesting. So, I yeah. will say my memory of Lucy is more than that. It's not like tremendously more, but no, it is more. No just you know to be honest the bit. fact that the knee was found about two to three kilometers away from the other lucy fossils and about 70 meters deep i think yeah, he's missing a full row of ribs you're right so i think he's being think. a little confusing here nobody is claiming that this is lucy's knee just that it belongs to the same species yeah, as that's lucy. i they have and i to can't know i can't tell if he's actually arguing that or not they like but there are some people really... who do yeah. they really like the Brian like, Thomas? Your average, your average person on the ground who's like listening to these things. Yes, I can totally believe that they would hear it from this guy and they'd believe it and fine. But like the person that he got this from, do, do they I, really? I, I'm me? not certain that he's arguing that it came from us. That it that people are claiming it came from Lucy. I I can't really tell if he's using Lucy in a colloquial sense or not here. That yeah, which is why it's important to be specific about yeah. what you're talking about as much as you can be. For underground, yeah, it didn't seem to slow them down one bit at all. Would you assume these fossils had anything to do with each other? Yeah, because they, they look basically the same. And anatomy is how we tell whether things belong to the same species or not in the fossil I, record. I would ask somebody who would knew more about the subject than I. <laughs> <laughs> This is what I would do, I right? Wouldn't. Like now, what I'm about to share with you comes from a gentleman I will call Dr. Z. Now I'm Canadian. I don't remember if we pronounce the letter Z here as Z or Z because I grew up in Niagara Falls and we would get TV from the US and they said it differently than we do here in Canada. So Whichever way they say it in the US, that's the way I said it. And my mom would always tell me I was saying it funny. Anyways, I will call him Dr. Z as he has not yet published this information and for the moment wishes to remain anonymous. By the way, uh, Dr. Zed has still not published his, his work. So I um, mean, yeah. And this is from, this is from a year ago. So I yeah. can't, I can't say, well, okay. I will say it can take more than a year to get something published. It can definitely, but I, um, like, yes. I, I am highly skeptical that Dr. Zed has anything significantly new to contribute to the discussion let's is say. dr zed real he mentions dr zed in the next video uh that we are going to very briefly skim over <laughs> so i i think it is he kindly gave me permission to share some of his research <laughs> and once he publishes his paper i will be sure to include uh references to his work on the complete creation website to go with this video and DVD. And I checked there and it's not there. So, yeah. Just from what he has told me, I already know that you will want to read that paper. I probably will. Maybe I should do a rebuttal when it comes out. Probably should. I don't think it's going to be anything new, but 
whatever. I mean, you Dr. should probably Zen read it and then forth. decide if you need to do a rebuttal, though, right? Well, once you see in a moment what Doctor Zed is claiming, it needs yeah, a that's a fair point. That that's a fair point. <laughs> I I was a like I was like you know I did a video against a flat earther recently, well, or with a flat earther, um, and that was amazingly fun. Did you ever see that? I did not get a chance yet. Oh, you got to watch it. Yeah. I have to... Um, he, he popped in here, actually. <laughs> I have to very momentarily lo- plug my computer back in so it does not die. So, one moment. This is all my fault, chat. I have a... Uh... I have definitely dramatically slowed the normal, wonderful, quick pace of uh, of, of Peter's uh, content. I am streaming off a laptop and using a hotspot, so this is a rather <laughs> precarious setup. <laughs> that's amazing. I got, I'm not gonna lie; that that's a really good hotspot. <laughs> the connection has been wonderful. I have had problems with it before. Um, and sometimes like videos will turn out like really blurry if I live stream them. So hopefully that's not the case here. People in the side chat should let us know if things are like terribly blurry. Challenge to both the evolutionists and us creationists. I have here a reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis. Now, the- look, okay. you're not fooling anybody oh, with that oh, ridiculous shoot. argument. Oh, um... Okay, so this is kind of where things get interesting. Oh, so he has a reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis that he made by taking... Um, I'm trying to find this here. He, he basically 3D printed some pieces of Lucy and then glued them together to make a reconstruction of her pelvis, which is cool. Um, but there are some issues with it, to say the least. My, uh, having a... Okay. On the Complete Creation website... Okay, so let me bring up this slide here. Um, so this here is what Lucy's pelvis actually looks like when you fit it together. And there are some issues with this arrangement. When we look at Lucy's oscoxy, um, what we see is that there's a portion of it which is kind of bent out of shape. Um, let's see. Basically, this thing should be more of a straight line, but we have this part right here, which is just like twisted inward. And there's all sorts of little breaks and stuff running through here. Oh, yeah. And so when we put it together, like we see uh, in this slide here, um, it affects exactly how things are angled. So that's how it fits together without reconstruction. It's not entirely anatomically accurate. So we have to do some reconstruction to make it like it would have been in life. But let me show you how he reconstructs Lucy's pelvis. That. And there are some big problems with it because as I noticed, he's actually put Lucy's innominate on the wrong side of the body and upside down. So <laughs> let me show you this next yeah. slide here. What he's done is he's taken the left innominate, put it upside down on the right side of the body and then he's taken the left pubis bone and he's left it in the correct place, but it's not attached to the proper innominate anymore. And that, like, to give you so an idea it's, of how it's, hard... It's backwards, but inconsistently yes. backwards. So l- l- here, let me, let me show you just so we make sure we got this. This is how it actually fits together. Like the joint, like... They, there's like physically a hole here that this like matches perfectly. And so yeah. it goes together like that. He took this, put it upside down and put it like that. And like, there's no way to even fit it together. So on the back of his model, he's just got yeah, a lot of glue put, so, apparently. So put it back. Like, I want you to toggle between the two configurations because okay. that looks nice. Like that Improper. just fits together. It's, it's beautiful. Improper. And the worst part of that is, okay, I have a, I have some uh, modern human uh, here. So what we see is, okay, normally these are like this. Back here in this gap here is the sacrum. So like this. But what he's done is he's flipped them upside down. 
and he's made them so that they connect at this point right here rather that's not a, that's than not this a small point. problem it is not that's a, small, not a problem. small problem that's that is that's that is way worse than putting your shoes on backwards that's putting your bones on backwards <laughs> like you physically cannot fit them together there's like literally a hole there and one piece fits into it like my the skeleton has one job it's to be in a certain shape and be not hard, to mention rigid. like <laughs> you could have looked at like a thousand different articles online that would have showed it in the proper orientation I did a stream recently, and after the stream, <laughs> I was I was very scared because I was I, I suddenly had a moment of panic course through me where I was like, did I get the ideal gas law wrong? And I was like, if I got the ideal gas law wrong, that would be <laughs> that would be really embarrassing and it would be problematic. And I, I didn't. It was fine. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> but like I was I was scared for a hot second. Yeah. This guy put the pelvis. The, he got the pe upside down right? and backwards. Like it doesn't even fit together that way. You, you like, you have to just keep pouring you glue to... on it to make it even <laughs> remotely try to try to stay in that configuration. <laughs> just keep pouring glue. <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah. so what's funny is i pointed this out on twitter so for the first time ever i saw ian juby on twitter so oh okay i'm i'm like hey did you realize that you put the oscoxy upside down and backwards on your model of lucy so he actually saw that and he responded to me so we're going to transition now to that video so we can catch that as well so let me pull that up here Ian corrects his boo-boo about Lucy, is what it's entitled. I... Uh, there we go. Okay, so he is going to talk about how... Um, when did this come out? Uh, today. W would you look at that? <laughs> I know. We are on topic here, aren't we? We're staying relevant. Okay. And so is he, apparently. Yesterday. <clears throat> Paleo Logos posted this on Twitter, on my Twitter on my timeline at Genesis week. Did you notice that your reconstruction of Lucy's pelvis has the os coxa? Now he did correct this ox os coxi. Uh, your os There's an coxi, E on the end that I forgot to add. And then I add that in the next week. So coxa, right? Not more than, um, it's pronounced os coxi. Cox, really? Yeah. That's none of the things that anybody had said on the stream. So, yeah, never mind. Yeah, I, I might have said it wrong before. Yeah, it's Oscoxy. No, you didn't. You didn't say that. The only person who had said anything were were me and him, and neither of us okay. said that. So, <laughs> okay, I believe that is the correct way. <laughs> Upside down and backwards. No, he is correct, or she, or they, them. I he don't know what their pronouns are. So uh, I'll just go with it. Uh, they are correct. And I've, it's very interesting. This show aired in April, April 15th of 2022. So 16 months ago. And Paleo Logos, you are the first to notice this. Uh, you're correct. I did not notice it. And I'm very grateful you pointed it out because uh, as, as we're about to see, this actually has a profound significance because my boo-boo actually detracted from my argument. So for context, his argument was that this was a human pelvis. He was saying it was mistakenly attributed to Lucy. And so Lucy is actually a mixture of human and ape bones. So for those who haven't seen it, uh, the, the reference for that video is in the description. So it was Genesis Week, too. episode 36, the very last one of the 40-part series. And if you're wondering why it's episode 36, it's because we had the, uh, the four-part miniseries in the middle on UFO. Someone I called Dr. Zed was, uh, was pointing out about Lucy's pelvis. Now, Lucy is a very famous fossil. Have you guys both heard of Lucy? 
I'm 16 years old. You said, yeah, thank you. <laughs> uh, put together a powerful case. Of we're, what we're two hours and 11 minutes in. We, we, we can skip them talking about whether they know about Lucy or not. <laughs> I only shared a very, very small part because he has yet to publish on this. Um, but basically what this boils down to is Johansson and team took eight fossils and human fossils all found in the same area, put them all together into one skeleton and called it our ancient ancestor. Okay. So that's a big claim. He doesn't really do a lot to substantiate other than saying, oh, well, the pelvis kind of looks human, so therefore it is human. Let's let's talk very briefly about some of the features of the pelvis that it shares with other australopiths. Um, so we have here, for example, the flaring iliac blade that isn't completely unique to australopiths because it also appears in Homo floresiensis. But australopiths generally have... Um, an iliac blade that sticks out to the side more. So earlier we were talking about chimp and gorilla pelvis and how they are just straight out to the sides, basically. And then the human curves around. So Lucy's curves around somewhat, but not like a modern humans, basically. Yeah. Um, another thing here is the distance between the anterior superior iliac spine, this little bump down there, that, and then the anterior inferior iliac spine. So there's these two bumps. And this is basically related to the shortening of the pelvis. So when we look at a human pelvis, we can see that the anterior superior iliac spine, this bump here, is very close to the anterior inferior iliac spine. There's just a little groove in between them. When we look at Lucy, what we see is that there's actually like a whole long uh, slope in between them. Yeah, at least for, at least relatively speaking. I don't know if they're all the same scale. I, yeah, I, no, I know I, Lucy's thing is smaller, right? Yeah, no, when we look at hers, it's it's much more obvious. Oh, yeah, yeah. Another thing is the inferiorly angled pubis. So this bone kind of, the, basically, if we think of this as two planes, the plane of the ilium and then the plane of the pubis, um, humans, these two planes are closer to each other. Lucy's pubis is angled downwards more than it is in humans. Um, we also have, um, for example, the auricular surface, which is basically where Lucy's pelvis attaches to the sacrum. It only goes down to the second sacral vertebrae, and that's different from what we see in modern people. Um, if we look at the back, there's also some things. So the iliac pillar in humans is like this robust um, bump of bone that goes all the way from the acetabulum, which is where your hip joint is, all the way up to the top. Lucy barely has one. And then it also is very close to the very edge of the uh, the ilium. And in humans, it, it isn't like that. Uh, another thing is uh, tuberoacetabular sulcus. You can see down there between the acetabulum, that kind of hole where your femur fits in, and the bottom, there's kind of a big bump there. Uh, or sorry, uh, a big groove. And in humans, we don't see a big groove like that. Um, and then we also see here um, when we look at the acetabulum, which is where your hip socket is, remember, and we look straight at it, Lucy's kind of ilium is more in line with that hip socket. When we look at a human, it's not really in line because they have more of that curvature that we were talking about. Um, so those are some yeah. features which can kind of distinguish Lucy from humans. It's like, it's crazy. Cause like, I I've seen you and others point all these things out like before and like, I see it like when you're pointing it out, but like, if you were to put it in front of me, it's, it's like some of it is clear, but some of it is like, I, I would not have ever thought of that with, well, not without thinking about it for like a lot, you know, mm -hmm. it's like everything else. Like the, the more Knowledge can go very deep into any particular topic. Part of it is just looking at stuff over and over again. Once yeah, you've seen exactly. stuff enough times, you start to yeah. see patterns and differences that you don't see when you're looking at things for the first time. Yeah, yeah. It, I mean, totally, totally. That's like nobody, some people are, but mo most people are not good at something the first time they try it. <laughs> yeah. I know I'm not. In particular, the pelvis is what, uh, I've forgotten his Twitter handle already, Paleo something, Paleologos. 
So Paleologos was not talking about this part here. It's talking about right here. No, actually, I was talking about that part. So yeah, this is the funniest like, part. He thinks that he is right now, but he literally misunderstood my whole point. I... Wow. So if we look at this reconstruction, he's talking about the pubis bone, right? And he's he's saying, oh, well, I yeah. showed him that he got these on the wrong side. No, but he doesn't. Those, are, just, those just... are the ones he actually has on the right side of the body. And now this picture... <laughs> This picture shows them flipped because I had to photograph all of these pieces laying down. But the point is that he has the pubis on the right side of the body. He completely missed the whole point that he's got the whole rest of the ilium on the wrong side of the body and upside down. Well, is his argument that is are those the same thing? Like, if you just reverse that one thing and then flip it over, is it the same no. thing? I don't think it is. It because isn't. the one, the thing that's on the inside is not suddenly now on the outside. And he's so got he's the inside wrong. on the outside, right? Yes. So he's still he's wrong. Got, he he's, 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 he's got it. It's not just backwards, it's inside out. <laughs> <laughs> so he's got, he, he doesn't realize that the whole point that, I didn't even notice like that um, at first, but what I was noticing obviously was the ilium. He's got the ilium flipped and that was the whole point, but he, he doesn't know enough about anatomy to realize that he's got the ilium upside down and on the wrong side of the body. Brilliant. And the, thing that, he's, <laughs> and the thing that he's got on the right side of the body, he thinks is wrong. I mean, well, you know, he, he's got a shoe for the moon, right? <laughs> Oh my. Oh, I I mean that that's what I literally said in my response. I mean, okay, so when I first watched his response you, right, video, I, I didn't Yeah, I didn't you're right. I didn't realize that he had those two pieces on opposite sides. And then yeah. he started he started making this point about these ones down here being separate and I'm like, "Oh, he did put those on the on the opposite sides too, which makes it even worse than I already thought it was." So oh. And nobody pointed this out for 16 months, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> Which was like, yeah, it was kind of weird, like how he was like phrasing that. It was almost like it was yeah, like the it viewer's was. fault for not pointing it out or yeah, something also, like that. Yeah, also, but I have your back. If you scroll down on the comments of the video now, of, <laughs> of the video that we're responding to. I, I have the video downloaded, so I don't actually have the oh, well, version well, pulled you should, up right now. You should pull it up on YouTube because I, <laughs> I left a comment saying, I have evidence in writing that you knew about this in January. And this was that was not the first time you told me about it. Like you mentioned it. Like I can I can show a screen cap if yeah I it. didn't I didn't <laughs> tell him about this until like very no, recently. I shared it with a lot of other it, people but, first. But you knew about it, so yes. <laughs> I so, was like, Peter knows what's up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that's amazing, though. I didn't. I know. How is it still uh, wrong? I, I... Yeah. It's like. Like, I it... just can't get over the fact that they don't fit together that way. Like. Bones it's fit together. It's wrong. It's like Lego pieces. It'd be like trying to put both of the studs pointing at each other and then thinking I mean, that was appropriate. What can I say about this guy? He don't think it'd be like it is, but it do. Well, okay. So at the very least, he does seem like pretty humble and like nice about it. He was glad that I pointed it out, but it, but it clearly shows that he doesn't know a ton about anatomy or he wouldn't yeah. still be making this mistake. Yeah. It's, I can't imagine opining so confidently on a subject that I wasn't willing to really back my stuff up with. Like, the, the, there's a reason I don't have a whole lot of stuff on YouTube, and it's mostly because I'm lazy. But the other part is because <laughs> I, I have a very limited t set of things that I would willing to opine on. <laughs> yeah. And that's, I feel like that's such a difficulty because I don't know a lot about Ian Juby, but what I do understand is that he's like a, a science popularizer. And that to me seems like a yeah. really difficult job. It, I mean, yeah, okay, it so does. Yeah. I am working on some popular science videos on some various topics right now. And I have a difficult time making them, especially when there's disagreement, because I just have no way of knowing whether who's right on the topic. 
And especially I when mean, it comes to like certain it, creation topics where I've, I've seen what the same person has said on a separate topic and they're completely wrong on that. So am I really going to trust them here? Yeah, it, it, I it's mean, difficult. It, what you got to do, what I feel like you got to do is you have to have like, as one of your resources, you have to have a lot of people that you can ask questions about. Yeah. Like yeah. if there's a small list of things that you can come and ask me about, and I'll at least be able to point you to like the right thing to an, enough that, you know, you know what you're doing about it. Right. Mm -hmm. But it's a small list. <laughs> yeah. Cause I know like three things and two of them are physics and one of them is Mario Kart Wii. <laughs> so. <laughs> <laughs> well, you would beat me at that. I, you I have not, both of those, but I have not, I have not played not... anybody better than me at Mario Kart Wii. I that's not because I'm particularly great at it, but I have not played that in years. Oh, it's my favorite game. I've I haven't played <laughs> it in over a year now, though. That's true. I haven't played it since I moved out here. Now, I actually i I went and dug it out of storage, and it's a funny story about how that wound up um, upside down backwards. So here's his excuse for why he got it wrong. And he's correct. So basically, the fossil itself is very fragmented. Uh, for example, if you take a close Yeah, but look, those casts that you're working with aren't, right? Yeah. The, it's got the whole... I, it's, it's The whole thing is... Okay, so what his cast is, though, is there are two pieces to it. So there's the pubis, and then there's yeah. the rest. So there are at least two pieces to his thing. There's another there's third piece, two, but I think they might two be Two pieces. He's making it 28 million. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's a horrible picture. But you can see right here, this part broken off. And so what happened, as you can see, all they have is the left side, this broken fragment, the coccyx, the tailbone. That's not the coccyx. That's the sacrum. The coccyx hangs down on the bottom of the sacrum. And that is clearly, that is clearly a human coccyx. I thought it was pronounced coccyx. It is. <laughs> okay. It is. Yeah. Um, it's not clearly a human sacrum or coccyx, if we're going by his terminology. Um, uh, there are some features of it which distinguish it from human sacrum, which I'm not going to go into for the sake of brevity. And what happened, I sculpted the different parts or print of 3d printed them basically and so the parts here because there was actually fragments missing uh from the joints here so i had that filled in with plasticine which is exactly what i've got here now normally you i wish i could zoom on on that closer to just see how much like glue plasticine is like covering the surface of that thing to make it work i mean he makes it sound like it's just the whole thing right so you you try and use like a bright colored plasticine so the fillings are obvious it, uh actually I've got mission accomplished right here <laughs> of there right there so uh, this one they've only actually got part of the fillings in so you can see all the breaks and cracks. This this hip was like fractured into. It doesn't impact your decision. There were two pieces you had to put together correctly, and you still fell. The whole mess. Yeah, of the, <laughs> I'm like, what is your point, bro? Like it came that part came preassembled. <laughs> <laughs> Not to mention they were all fossilized together. I'm pretty, I'm quite certain that they didn't even piece those pieces together. They were naturally fossilized together. So yeah, that is interesting because then it's like how how are they cracked if they're so it was together? cracked early post post mortem, and then they it was fused. fossilized. They fused. Okay, yeah, yeah. Of course, uh, many many of the longtime viewers will be well familiar with this story because Owen Lovejoy, the anatomist, uh, has got that infamous video of him taking a Dremel. To the different to casts of the different fragments, tapioca prediction. Yeah, because <laughs> it didn't look. Uh, it, it was it was distorted. Correct. It was distorted. So remember earlier how I showed you how there was that piece that was like twisted and broken, and there were cracks in it. Well, that's because 
somehow it got damaged. Some people think something stepped on it and broke that part, but we, d we don't really know. But somehow it got damaged. So to, to restore it, we have to basically take that piece and put it back into line with the rest of the iliac blade. Because as it is right now, it is not biologically possible. Because yeah, it's just it's not it, viable. It doesn't work. Yes, biomechanically. In the, in the front of the pelvis, the two pubis bones don't come close enough for their gap to be filled with cartilage, which is the arrangement in like every single creature that has a pelvis. So we know that it has to be modified. Now, why exactly were they using a Dremel? Well, because they made a cast of this, and all these pieces, all these different pieces that were angled differently to one another, are all fused together. So to separate the pieces so that you can fit them together the right way, you have to take them out of this piece of plaster where they're all together. So to do that, you have to cut the various pieces out so that you can have each of the individual pieces so that you can put them together. So and he doesn't seem not... to understand it. He seems to think that they're modifying it, and they're not. They're just taking yeah. these individual pieces that are delineated by the cracks and then showing how they fit together individually so the the fossil as it came out of the ground was that broken apart afterwards and and reassembled in part no it was in as far it was entirely it was it was very very closely casted to be as identical as it could be and then they messed with the cast right yes uh-huh but okay. as I understand, there were only a, a few pieces of the pelvis. So there was that pubis that broke off and the smaller piece down there. And I think most of the top of that innominate was all preserved together like that. Yeah. Which is why but they like, made the cast like, and then had to cut out the pieces. Yeah, but, but like cr cracked, but still connected. Exactly, right. And That's so, super interesting, yeah. So it's almost like taking a puzzle and then like crumpling it up so that the puzzle pieces are still kind of fitting in with yeah, one another, yeah. but they're like at different but angles. You, yeah. Oh, well, why do we have to them. separate them to get it to lay flat? Because we know how puzzles work, bro. That's how. <laughs> <laughs> like, otherwise the yeah. puzzle doesn't work. <laughs> exactly. And I agree with them on that point, but what are you doing taking a Dremel to make it fit better because it's broken and we need to isolate the individual pieces he wasn't modifying any piece he was cutting each of the individual pieces out of the cast so he could have all the individual pieces so he could piece them together like it was without being distorted so yeah i mean could, could you can you guys imagine the firestorm that would happen if a creationist took a fossil and said oh that that looks too much like an ape human. But that's not what he was doing. He was... Res you just agree it was broken. He was fixing how it was broken. <laughs> yeah, and honestly, if a creationist did that, I wouldn't care so much as long as he let other people look at it. Yeah. Or, yeah. or she. As long as they let other people like examine the specimen, mm -hmm. I'd be like, fine, go for yeah. it. Because you guys are out here claiming... Uh, not you, Peter, but they're out here claiming that you've got like a fossilized foot in a boot. And it's like, <laughs> no one can see it, though. And it was gone in the 1930s or, you know. <laughs> yeah, sure. <laughs> that That's all this like random uh, out of place artifacts. Carl oh, Boss they suddenly stuff. mysteriously disappeared. Yeah. Here, I'm going to adjust it and fix the distortion. Oh, I'm going to do it with a Dremel. <laughs> Uh, I, you can imagine the firestorm that would happen, right? So I still, I still hold Owen Lovejoy uh, in contempt for that one, in contempt of court. Uh, regardless, this is his reconstruction. What I also did was I then mirrored it, so you could see she had uh, both sides. Okay, no, he's still fitting it together wrong. He's still got the nominates upside down. <laughs> and so it was mirrored and you see you got a better, better look. I also had the pieces in here. Now, the day I went to film that, that episode, I was moving everything around and it was stinking hot in here, just like it is today. 27 degrees Celsius currently, and I've kept it cool all day. Uh, I don't know what that is in Fahrenheit, Roland. It's probably like 85, maybe 90. Yeah, that's about right. No. <laughs> No, it's, it's thinking hot. So I'm moving this around 
and the plasticine, basically it melted in the heat. It got soft and these bone fragments fell off. Now these ones are easy to put back in place, but I was in a hurry because it was one of those, it was Tuesday, literally. So presumably he wants us to think that he had it arranged properly first, but then mistakenly put them on wrong later. Yeah, Except properly, that, if, like he does. If now. that were the case, though, we would expect that he would have them properly now when he's reevaluating <laughs> it, but he still doesn't. So he put it on wrong first and then blames it on not having time later. Oh, man. Literally, I'm supposed to have the show edited, closed captioning done, everything delivered to the television station, preferably by Tuesday night. And Tuesday afternoon, I'm moving this over and everything falls apart. So I frantically put it all back together. I, obviously, I wasn't paying attention because Paleo's logos is absolutely correct. You're still not paying attention. <laughs> well, yeah. that's the thing is he is, though. <laughs> he just doesn't know what he's talking about. <laughs> it's not that he's not paying attention, it's that he has no idea what he's talking about. I I think if I sent Lucy's bones to you, I bet you could fit them together like they're supposed to go. I mean, if you can... You want to send Lucy? We can do this. This can, this can be an experiment that we do. <laughs> I put it on upside down and backwards. Now... Why I think this is so entertaining is because, first of all, it's taken 16 months for someone to point this out. There are a lot of haters out on the internet who would just love to embarrass and shame me and my mistakes. Oxide oh, is oh, upside down. No. Why I think this is so entertaining is because, first of all, it's taken 16 months for someone to point this out. There are a lot of haters out on the internet who would just love to embarrass and shame me and my mistakes. Why has nobody pointed this out before? It's very interesting. Uh, guesses? I mean, you pointed it out to him the first time you had, like, an obvious opportunity to, like, do it to him. You said, because you said, I think, that it was the first time that you saw him on Twitter was, I think. Yeah. And you can't really it. send a picture over YouTube comments. Yeah. Um, but like, I don't know that there are that many people who are like critically watching you in the first place or that have like anatomical knowledge. But like, I will say if, if you didn't put a comment on the video, Peter, you should have put a comment on the video. I guess I should have. Right. Like I'm I mean, at fault here, obviously. Well, I'm, that that's not what I meant, <laughs> but, but but like <laughs> you know, <laughs> because if you correct my mistake, it actually dramatically strengthens the case I was making in that video. So Does apparently, it? there's an evil cabal to hide from him how Lucy's pelvis actually fits together, so that it doesn't help his argument. Okay, but here's the problem. Every single museum or place that you would see Lucy's pelvis or any published photograph of Lucy's pelvis has it the right way. Yeah. Well, so, I mean, not anymore. These are published photographs. <laughs> and he doesn't have them the right way. Okay, everyone but me <laughs> has figured this out. <laughs> My point is, like, it's not, an, it's not somehow, oh, we're going to conspire against him so that this doesn't support his evidence. No. Everywhere else, they literally have it right. You're the only one who got it wrong. So Yeah, but that's not how victim mentality works. <sighs> I guess so. Are you gonna play and I would video? encourage you all to go and check out that video. Dr. Z's point was that that is not the hip of our ancient half-ape, half-human half ancestor. What is that thing, by the that way? What's the, the little nub there? Uh, okay. That's called the ischial spine. What's it, it, it it's it's a site from muscle attachment. I don't remember the exact muscle that it goes off it, but it's more developed in uh, in in her than in modern humans generally. And I don't know that it shows up so strongly developed in Australopithecines either. So it's it's kind of uniquely to her that it's that developed. There might be some other cases, but it's it's a, it's a little odd. 
is the fossil hip bones of a pygmy human. Now, I have here again another replica, and this is to scale, of a pygmy human pelvis. And unfortunately, the reason the parts in question in Lucy's hip aren't here is because after I filmed that, I went on the road for a short tour out in Nova Scotia. I had this with me. And once again, the plasticine melted. These parts fell off and apparently fell under the table. And I didn't see it when I left Halifax. So uh, I got a text from Pastor Rob like two days later with a photo of the, of the fossil parts, right? He's like, is this yours? Oh, yeah, yeah, that's mine. So I'm afraid I don't have it here to correct it. You do though. That that part was the part that you got right. The part that you're still holding together is the part that you got wrong. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's painful. That's really painful. I don't know what to do about that. <laughs> like that's that that remind that reminds me of a Tompkins thing. Uh, oh yeah, <laughs> not waiting the sequences. That's yes. just it's. Is that he's like, I don't know what they're talking about. Like, we're not crazy, right, Peter? Like, that's... <laughs> he should know what we're talking about, right, Peter? <laughs> he should. He should be yeah. able to piece this together with his eyes closed. Y yes. Oh, and then... <sighs> it's not It's not like if you do two stretches of, of a road trip, because that's a sample size of two. I had a sample size of 50,000. That's not how waiting works, bro. <laughs> okay, sorry. I'm yeah. done. Well, I think uh, that might be as far as we need to go in this video as well. I think we've got, um, we've heard quite a bit from Ian this evening. We got through a, a bit of his material. Oh, what a, what a champion of, of, of a sort, I suppose. Yeah, I, <laughs> I, I can't get over how he just failed again. Like I, I tried oh. to help him and he just failed again. Wow. Yeah. I'm like, you got to, when you, if you, it's. It reminds me kind of of the lawyers who got caught with the fake uh, cases with chat GPT. Yeah. Because <laughs> the the real, really embarrassing thing about that is they got called out on it and they doubled down in the, yeah. the first round. They doubled down. And we're like, no, we these are these are legit. And then and I'm like, no, dude, if somebody's calling you out on it, you got to check. You got to like. Which You're I don't think he's doubling down, but it, it, he's, somehow he still ends up being wrong. So, yeah, it's not exactly parallel, but like yeah. in spirit. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, thank you to everyone who tuned in this evening. I hope you all had a wonderful uh, time. We'll see if maybe uh, maybe we'll do more streams like this in the future. I don't know. Um, I don't know if there's going to be many more videos on this channel coming from me, um, but I will update you in the future when I have uh, some videos coming out on uh, some other places. So uh, I hope you all have enjoyed this. Thank you so much for joining me, uh, Michael. And thank you also for the generous super chat. And I hope everyone has a good evening.